and uh, it's a countdown here to going live, and it looks like we're live. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, this is Magnitude Live number six, and I'm Chuck Tagami with Magnitude. Uh, really, what we're doing here is we have something that's infecting the entire planet, uh, and it's humans. <laughs> Uh, and well, that and right now we're dealing with this pandemic. Uh, and so we want to be able to bring the world together and explore the world uh, through the lens of science and engineering practice, uh, most appreciably through aerospace and astronautics. So uh, as we uh, dive in week after week, we are able to bring in some pretty amazing guests. Um, let's see, I think someone might be, uh, that's probably me. That's uh, got a <laughs> feedback loop there. Can fix that. Um, uh, each week we add some very interesting guests, and today we're joined, uh, starting the, off the top of the show, with uh, Bill Brown, a NASA engineer working on a pretty amazing project, SLS. So, Bill, I'd like you to maybe share a little bit about what you're working on right now, a little bit about your background, and what I'm super excited about. Bill has helped us incredibly with our students uh, throughout uh, the world, really, uh, in launching uh, these little sky trackers, which are. Uh, really instruments that fly up to around 30,000 feet or so. Uh, and Bill will tell us much more about it and how it's put them together in a super low way. Just using like a Mylar party balloon. Wow. <laughs> how about that? Uh, so Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're working on right now. Um, I'll turn it to speaker view so we can get a good sense of what you're up to. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Loud All right. and clear. Well, I work at the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, and uh, we're doing the, uh, <clears throat> I'm primarily involved with uh, testing the flight avionics, all the electronics that uh, operate the main stage uh, of the rocket. Um, and it's, uh, we call it the core stage. And so we're doing uh, a simulation lab where we do hardware in the loop, where we're testing the flight software using actual hardware and they have this we have this big lab that uh, stands about 40 feet tall and it's got all on racks all the electronics situated similar to how they're going to be placed in the actual rocket itself and uh, to control everything the telemetry and firing the rockets and uh, monitoring the sensors uh, during the first part of the flight so um, we're uh, heavily involved in uh, doing active testing on that uh, to keep on schedule. Um, and we're using uh, teleconferencing now because we've been on uh, the center buildings are closed right now. So uh, we are been teleworking uh, at home and attending meetings, answering emails and doing PowerPoint presentations. And, mm. and uh, we're continuing on and we've been doing that for two weeks now uh, quite successfully so uh, remote telework as as you can see uh, we've got people from all over the world here tied in uh, it works great so uh, plus i don't have that uh, long nasty commute from my uh, house uh, to the marshall space flight center in huntsville and that's in huntsville alabama mm -hmm. is where we're located mm -hmm. so uh, it's working great. We're, um, we're really excited about these uh, missions coming up, the Artemis One uh, mission, uh, which will use our space launch system uh, uh, rocket, which is, will be the largest rocket ever built and flown. Uh, it's larger than the Saturn V. And we're going to do a, a mission around the moon and back to test out everything before we do a crewed mission, which will be our second flight, Artemis II, will be an actual crewed mission. So mm -hmm. it'll be uh, quite exciting. And these are exciting times to be a NASA engineer because it's just like the Apollo era all over again, just 50 years later. <laughs> just <So>. a few. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it took 50 years to get back to this stage, but. Well, I think something about um, budgets. <laughs> But right. uh, so in addition to that, you've had, uh, would you call it a hobby or passion, uh, but you make actually the most amazing device, the Sky Tracker. And uh, well, you've seen, yeah, you've seen the uh, videos probably online of people showing uh, pictures of the edge of space with a toy train or some figure mm -hmm. on a, on a um, GoPro camera. 
So uh, I did the very first one of those flights in America uh, 33 years ago. In 1987, I flew the very first high altitude balloon carrying amateur radio and sending down its, it didn't actually send down its position because we had to do it without GPS. GPS did not exist. So we used the good old fashioned World War II method of direction finding a hidden transmitter. And we were quite successful at locating these things. So you're still triangulating, but- Using triangulation. Yes, oh. yes, absolutely. So uh, we, uh, we uh, pioneered this for the use of using high altitude balloons for uh, STEM flights and in getting uh, students involved and in learning about, because uh, these are basically a mini space mission to the very edge of space. We're going up to uh, into the stratosphere to 100,000 feet where you can actually see the curve of the earth and the blackness of space. After you get above about 55,000 feet, you can actually see the blackness of space. And I have a couple uh, pictures of that in my uh, PowerPoint, which I should probably get into right now. So uh, <laughs> okay. let me show you a few slides. Um, so that's the traditional high altitude balloon flights. They use a large weather balloon and we can carry up to 12 pounds of payload, six pounds per okay, So Bill, uh, if you're sharing your screen, it didn't pop up problem. yet. Oh, I haven't uh, done the PowerPoint yet. Okay. So uh, let me do that next. Uh, sure. Uh, we also, we're also pretty excited working with you, Bill, in that we have uh, a handful of your sky trackers. And we're announcing today that once a week, starting next week until the end of June, we're going to put one of these aloft. Uh, mostly here from Northern California, but we might be able to get some going up somewhere else. Maybe we get that one in South Africa finally up in the air. Um, I'm hoping we right. can get something done. There's still some people we need to speak to down here regarding just uh, getting around the Civil Aviation Act and everything around that. So oh, I'm there you go. I bet Bill can probably give us a hand down there. there. Oh, that's great, Shilar. Okay. So you guys so are going to hopefully we can get something sorted there. I'm really <laughs> hoping to get that. <laughs> That would be yes. fantastic. Okay. And where are you at, uh, Shavar? I'm in South Africa right now, Durban to be exact, but I'm assisting with uh, the schools in Cape Town. Okay, good. Uh, are you involved with the three that I sent to South <laughs> Africa? Yes. yes. Okay, good. <laughs> the ones that were very hard to find. <laughs> right, it took Yes, oh, that was another story. <laughs> If you would have just had your trackers live on that, we would have known exactly where they were. <laughs> I think I should uh, balloon mail them from now on. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would look better at this point. <laughs> there you go. All right. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? We okay? are. Fantastic, uh, sir. Go right ahead. All right. So uh, the latex balloons, they go up. They take about two hour, hour and a half to two hours to get to 100,000 feet. And the balloon expands and it finally pops. A parachute comes out and carries everything back down to the ground. And it's great if you're carrying up YouTube cameras and you want to show, take some experiments up, uh, but uh, they're very short flights. So I developed a, um, a tracker that weighed uh, 12 grams, less than half an ounce to fly on a party balloon, one of those Mylar for foil party balloons. And they can actually float in the jet stream and they can go around the world in 14 days if you hit the winds just right. Uh, so I developed the Sky Tracker, and it's totally solar powered. We're talking totally green, so uh, no batteries, and it uses very lightweight, thin film, flexible solar cells by Power Film Solar. The reason I use these instead of the monocrystalline cells is that these can take a lot of abuse. When I go into a school and launch these from a school, the kids like to touch the sky tracker and play with the solar cells. And uh, it can take a lot of abuse. Plus, if you launch it and there's a downdraft and it smashes into the ground, it won't hurt it. So uh, I use a guitar string uh, for the antenna elements. I have a 19 inch wire going up and down um, made out of guitar string, string and that's my antenna. And the uh, little white uh, object you see in the center is a GPS receiver. 
Uh, there's a little microcontroller on board that uh, is the same used in the Arduinos, which is a popular tool uh, to teach uh, students how to program. And uh, in fact, I use the Arduino uh, development environment to program these. And then uh, at the bottom of the board, there's a little clock synthesizer that actually transmits on a ham radio frequency of 144.39 megahertz. And that sends a little burst of data every two minutes with the GPS data. It sends down the location, altitude, temperature, and it uh, sends down the solar panel voltage. So we have full telemetry from this board, all in a 12 gram package. And that's the size of the balloon that we've been using. It's a 36 inch uh, silver foil balloon made by Qualitex. The Qualitex brand seems to work the best. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend just going to your local party balloon store and just getting whatever's off the shelf. Um, I order these from a company called balloonsfast.com and um, they're about four dollars a piece plus postage so um, and it takes very little helium or hydrogen i actually prefer hydrogen uh, but if you're in a classroom setting most schools frown on using hydrogen amongst a bunch of students so since i'm inflating in my barn it doesn't make much difference but uh, helium is certainly a good way of going you'll fly about three thousand feet lower in altitude Bill, what I, I, I absolutely love the elegance of the design. It it it's so it looks so much like the the International Space Station. It's just it's it's and I've seen one and it, it's just delicate and beautiful. So congratulations on the on the design of it as well. I mean, just technically it's great, but but aesthetically it's also very pleasing. Well, I tried to make it look like a little mini weather satellite because what we're doing here is a very low, 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 low Earth orbiting satellite that takes 14 days instead of an hour and a half to go around the world. <laughs> and you give the same, uh, the students get the same effect as flying their very own space mission. Yeah. Uh, as they can track it every day and they get to learn about geography, the people and cultures of wherever country you're flying over. And, um, and as you know, geography uh, is one of those uh, topics in schools that are not not covered very well anymore. And so um, several of the students, the uh, groups that I send these to, they learn a lot about how to interpret maps and uh, where even the US states are. So it's very uh, lightweight. It can be launched in upwards of about 10 knot winds. I've actually launched one in a 25 knot wind. But uh, you have to make sure that uh, you have about a thousand feet to two thousand feet before you hit a tree line if it's that windy. Uh, but I was on an airport runway and it went right down the runway and we managed to get it off the ground in a 20 knot wind. So, uh, but typically I, I recommend you fly these under your about uh, 10 knots. So uh, it's a one hand launch. Uh, so one student can fly these. I usually have two students, uh, one holding the balloon and one holding the actual sky tracker payload. A uh, quick question. Yes. Uh, how do you deal with uh, power lines? Ah, well, uh, you'll see what happened. I have a video of, of one that hit a power line. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you make sure that uh, for every uh, one mile per hour surface wind, you are about 200 feet from any obstacle. So go out to a football field or someplace away from power lines and trees um, if it's uh, going to be about five knots. So how far can they go? Well, my very first flight, um, it floated at 27,000 feet and uh, I was a little heavy with my first payload and it went up to across the east coast up to nova scotia across the atlantic in 32 hours and the exact same time and almost the same path as Lindbergh's first flight across the atlantic and ended up uh, in france where Lindbergh arrived 
and then spent an additional few days traversing Europe and ended up hitting an ice storm off the coast of Stockholm and ended up in the Baltic Sea. So uh, this is just on a little party balloon. Now, how do you predict where it's going to go? Well, we float in the jet stream and uh, they, you can see the white and the yellow is where the maximum winds of the jet stream. This is a site called windytv.com. Now the 36 inch uh, Mylar foil balloons typically float between 27,000 to 32,000 uh, feet, depending on whether you're using helium or hydrogen. Uh, I have a little bit larger balloon that's made out of a material called, it's basically plastic sushi wrap and a company called Scientific Balloon Solutions uh, sells this larger balloon. But instead of $4 a piece, they're over $150 just for the balloon. But and how big are that, those? Those will float between 40 and 45,000 feet, which gets you above uh, the majority of, uh, of your storms. You're still at risk between 27 and 32,000 feet. So um, if you go to this site, windytv.com, it'll allow you to, there's a little slider bar, it'll show you the surface winds, but it'll also show you how to, uh, um, at different altitudes, what the wind fields are going to be. So we fly around 7,000 to 9,000 meters in altitude. So you could just slider the bar up to 7,000 meters or 9,000 meters, and you can see about where your balloon's gonna go <clears throat> in the next day or two. Of course, the winds shift, but it, to give you a good idea of when the jet stream is overhead. So my very first, uh, one of the highest speeds that I achieved in one of my flights, this is a party balloon floating in the jet stream. How fast of a ground speed do you think you can achieve? Any, anybody? I'm gonna weigh in, but I, I could weigh in, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Uh, 220 miles per hour. Holy smokes. Okay. I think we've got that. If you get that uh, yellow area of the jet stream, those are the fastest winds. And we have actually seen our Pico balloons going over 200 miles an hour. Amazing. Now, how do you predict the flight path? There is a really cool site and the, the link is down below. And it's, uh, if you search for NOAA Ready High Split, H-Y-S-P-L-I-T, um, and you enter your float altitude and your date and your location, uh, it'll give you predicted flight path over about a week's period of time. And this is the flight done by, from Los Angeles. It was last heard over Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland. In fact, it hit a storm. It was knocked out of the sky because it collected ice in the storm and didn't have, it actually bounced around between 10,000 feet and 20,000 feet. As it would collect ice, it would come down, the ice would melt, come back up again and collect ice. Did Just that like all day long. <laughs> it did that all day long. And finally at night, it came down and landed in the trees. Usually that's the end of a flight. Somehow it managed to get loose from the trees the very next day and took off again and went back up to 27, 20, uh, 30,000 feet. And uh, the prediction I did for that, it went right over next to Washington, D.C. It showed a big loop. You see that big loop there in the wind pattern because there was a big storm and it looped around the low pressure area of the storm. So uh, it showed up this morning coming back from the ocean. And this is the flight predicted flight path. And you see it's following right along the predicted mm. flight, flight path. And this is a uh, little silver Mylar party balloon launched from Los Angeles uh, three or four days ago using hydrogen. Now it's gonna loop back around and finally head on across the Atlantic towards France. Uh, and it'll probably be in France in about a, a five or six days. Isn't this uh, this exciting? is a, one of the, this is a really cool site, uh, tracker.habhub.org, stands for High Altitude Balloon Hub, and it's uh, run by uh, folks in the UK High Altitude Society in Great Britain, and they have, uh, they show all the current 
amateur radio high altitude booth flights, both Pico balloons and regular latex flights, are displayed on this map. And you can select each one, and there's a little telemetry graph down there that will show you telemetry if the balloon's sending uh, data down. So I highly recommend you go and follow this map. Uh, you can also go to APRS.FI, and that if, if you know the actual call letters of your flight. In this case, it's KM6BWB-7. And when um, Ted flies, his will be KK6UUQ, dash, and there'll be a number for each flight. Number two. So uh, those are the silver mylar balloons. This is what the sushi wrap balloon looks like. <laughs> and it's a very tough plastic. Uh, it's impermeable to uh, gas loss because they want to keep sushi fresh. So this keeps the uh, helium or hydrogen in. So it's about three by seven and a half feet and a little more difficult to handle in a classroom setting, but it has been done. And you see my big tank of uh, helium in the background. Plus I have a tank of hydrogen, a little small tank of hydrogen I use. And this is what it looks like uh, being launched. And this particular one, uh, I flew on an HF frequency and uh, a very low power mode called Whisper, Weak Signal Propagation Reporter. And it uh, allows you to send a very small HF signal, which bounces off the ionosphere and can be heard thousands of miles away. And the uh, ones that we used on the foil balloons I showed you earlier with the guitar string, uh, those uh, are VHF, so they're line of sight only. They can be heard about 300 miles in all directions. But uh, these have 34 feet of magnet wire, so they're a lot more difficult to launch. But you can get reports every day. So uh, my first flight with one of these stayed up 75 days and went around the world six times. <laughs> really? <Flying> around 40,000 <laughs> feet. Six times. Yes. And it finally crossed into the Southern Hemisphere and bounced around the equator and hit a big storm off the Ivory Coast of Africa and came down in the jungles of the Ivory Coast of Africa. So, anybody who wants to go and uh, risk their lives in the jungles of the Ivory Coast, I can tell you <laughs> almost exactly where to look for it if you want to go retrieve it. <laughs> Might be a little far even for South Africa. I don't know. <laughs> so this way you have um, basically a low Earth orbiting satellite, very low Earth orbiting satellite mission that the students can track for weeks and months. Uh, we had uh, we sent the very first middle school around the world, um, not the class, the balloon. And we did this from Baxter, Minnesota, from Forestville Middle School. I actually did a Skype uh, link to them to uh, talk them through how to inflate the balloon on their very first launch. So you can see me in the screen giving them advice on how to fill it up. And all the students, uh, this is the uh, seventh grade, seventh and eighth graders, I believe. And they, uh, they managed to get this one to go completely around the world one and a half times. That's awesome. UC San Diego, uh, we had their engineering uh, students. Uh, they had a space club and they uh, flew their balloon around the world six times uh, over the three month period. It finally ended up uh, getting lost over Singapore after flying six times around the world. So I wanted to talk a little bit also about uh, your traditional uh, latex balloons. This is a photo that if it had been taken, if we had planned to take a photo like this, this is a latex hab balloon, high altitude balloon, photographed at 53,000 feet from another balloon flying 200 feet away from it. <laughs> <laughs> so it happened to his camera, happened to point at my balloon at that at exact moment and the, we launched them at the same time along with about 10 other balloons at this conference. And these two happened to just 
be perfectly aligned as lift and they stayed within 200 feet during the entire flight. In fact, they almost tangled up a thousand feet in the air. So uh, if we had tried to do this as a government project, it would cost a million dollars and it'd probably fail. <laughs> <laughs> But you can see, even at 53,000 feet, you see the thin blue haze, mm -hmm. that's the Earth's atmosphere, and you see the blackness above it. You actually see the blackness of space at 53,000 feet. We have an annual event. I'm not sure if it's going to happen in person this year. It's going to be in the middle of July. Uh, and we have teams from around the world that come to talk about their experiments their techniques and learn about uh, the different payloads. And so we launch uh, nine, We this year we launched nine latex weather balloons and we chase them. Uh, we have chase crews, part of the fun is in the chase. Oh yeah. And we launched three of the Pico balloons in this particular one. And that's what it looks when you have seven latex balloons in the air at the same time. It kind of looks like the constellation Orion, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now we also launched some Pico balloons into the total eclipse, which uh, in our case, our closest spot was Clarksville, Tennessee. And this photo, these photos were actually taken by my brother. And that's the diamond ring effect when the, the shadow uh, covers the sun completely. And they, uh, we launched a hundred ham radio balloons and university balloons across the nation. You can see the path of the eclipse on the left. On the right, you can see all the ham radio balloons that were flying during that particular time. And you can actually trace the path of the eclipse by looking at the balloon path. So we decided to fly three uh, Pico balloons. Now these are solar powered, but we wanted to see uh, the temperature as it started to drop before we lost enough power to operate. And we wanted to see um, just how long the eclipse would last for these peak of balloons. They stayed up three or four days and stayed in formation all the way off to the coast uh, until they were last heard off the coast of Cape Cod. So we had a lot of fun with that and uh, we learned a lot. The temperature dropped by several degrees during the eclipse. I think about seven or eight degrees centigrade. Fascinating. Now, we do a lot of student flights. Uh, this is a senior design engineering class at our University of Alabama in Huntsville. And uh, we launch typically five balloons a semester. Um, they haven't been doing them lately, but uh, that actually on the right is one of their payloads. We let them get a little creative in their payload design. The light, actually, the eyes actually light up. Can you imagine finding this in your field and having this thing light up? You would think that the aliens have attacked. <laughs> but the payload actually worked. Now, one thing uh, I want to point out is that when you have students and you're doing a launch, it's important to do a checklist. And we launched one of these big student experiments and it had two big toggle switches on it that they had to turn on before they launched it to turn on their cameras and their sensors. And it's a thousand I, I asked the students are you ready to fly they said yep thumbs up so i let the balloon go off went their payload it's a thousand feet in the air when i heard one student say to the other did you turn it on and the other student said no i thought you did <laughs> we actually recovered it because we had a secondary tracker on it that gave us our landing spot position and uh but we made the students write a paper and present it on the importance of checklists. Mm. I've discovered that firsthand, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the future of amateur radio ballooning. We actually did this for real for the Weather Channel. Uh, that is the easy chair from the movie Up. We got the drawings from Pixar and we replicated the old man's easy chair. And we sent up the actor uh, he was tethered. He actually shot out one of the balloons with a pellet gun to demonstrate buoyancy. He was neutrally buoyant, had some positive lift. He shot out one of the balloons and he came down slowly. 
So then we put a pilot in it and he, we let it go free flight and he went up to 14,000 feet for nine hours and flew 150 miles down range. Uh, he was a ham radio operator. So I was talking to him on a walkie talkie to his walkie talkie and his handheld. And I said, you know, Jonathan, I think you better come down because you're approaching deliverance country and there's no roads in there. You hear chainsaws and banjo music. You don't want to go in there. So he finally, how do you think he came down? Actually, he just had a knife and he cut three of these balloons loose and he started on his way down. He actually had bags of water ballast that he would dump out to go back up. Hmm. So he came down and landed in a tree and it took him a while to get out of the tree. He had to dump some of his water ballast over to get out of the tree, landed in the middle of a cow pasture. And as my chase crew came in to rescue him, he was bouncing 10 feet in the air because he's almost neutrally buoyant. <laughs> and with a hundred cows racing behind him, thinking they were going <laughs> to Tony, it sounds like one of your recent recoveries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've, we've had that kind of situation. <laughs> so I wanted to show you this last slide. Uh, one of our science summer camps we do. Oh, I, I didn't hear that. What's that? Oh, I think someone's got their mic live. Someone's got a hot mic. Yeah. OK. So uh, we were doing a uh, science camp at Spaceport, Indiana. and we asked what uh, should we send up for an experiment? And the Angry Birds in space was the big game at the time. So we decided to send up an Angry Bird to near space. And we also sent up fishing crickets because there's an internet uh, posting that fishing crickets could hold their breath for two hours. And as you know, anything posted on the internet is gotta be true, right? <laughs> So we decided, well, fishing crickets, they're gonna be eaten by fish anyways. So that if they don't survive, it won't be that big of a deal. So uh, typically we avoid mammals and that kind of stuff, but we decided to fly the fishing crickets and I didn't have any high hopes for them. Uh, when we got back down to the ground, we opened up the canister of fishing crickets and they all jumped out they were they had survived so the internet rumor actually was true in this case we set up some wild stuff like uh, bananas uh, banana nice yellow banana comes back and it's mushy and brown it looks like a banana that's been in the refrigerator for about a year and we also flew uh, are you familiar with the uh, pastry the moon pie pastries um, they're made out of uh, chocolate covering and they've got a marshmallow and cookie okay. thing. Well, we flew one of those and uh, it was squished. Your mom tell her we'll call her back after. It was squished by half and it, uh, because of the vacuum of near space, you're in 99% of the Earth's atmosphere, you're above 99% of the Earth's atmosphere at this altitude. And so we had a controlled taste test between the space moon pie and the regular moon pie we kept on the ground. And by far, we had uh, the space moon pie was the big favorite. Hmm. Now, as you can see in this picture, we're at about uh, 80,000 feet at this particular point. The thin blue haze of the atmosphere is mighty thin at this point, And you can see the blackness of space quite clearly, plus the curvature of the Earth. So um, I wanted to show one or two short videos. Mm -hmm. if hey, Bill, while you're doing that, I realized that we got a couple more guests that jumped in, including uh, retired astronaut Greg Johnson. And I think he's okay. had a view probably uh, similar to this, maybe more extraordinary. <laughs> Greg, welcome to, thank you for joining us. Uh, you're welcome, Ted. And I, I saw that Mike Lepresti he is also on the line. He beat me by a, about a minute or two. Awesome. Hey, uh, and it was, we're just trying to spin, get, get up to speed here. I'm okay. just listening. Oh, fantastic. So uh, it, real quickly, before Bill shows us a quick video, um, we this is really kind of organic. Uh, over the last three weeks, we've been finding a way to outreach to teachers around the world. Uh, we have teachers from Germany right now, from Japan, and from South Africa that are joining us on this session. This is a live feed into YouTube as well. And our objective really is to uh, 
have a, a, a common view. Uh, this pandemic is affecting the entire world uh, and it's very easy to be consumed by the latest numbers or whatever those may be. And really what we wanna do is uh, be encouraged to think about uh, what science and engineering has done uh, for the planet up till now. And that's where we put our faith. Uh, and uh, just being able to have, we'll have an exogeologist join us a little later today. You're joining us now, Greg. And Mike, thank you for joining us as well. We have some teachers aboard here. And Bill is working on the SLS mission down in Huntsville at Marshall. Uh, and that's his real job, I guess. And what this is, uh, I guess, with buying um, your halves for 30 plus years is, uh, is quite a passion project. And so uh, we're just learning from Bill the th different things he's done. And uh, I know we've launched these at, uh, he's launched them at the, um, at the Chamborees, the Boy Scout Chamborees. Uh, these were his uh, devices. And uh, what we're going to do starting next week is we're gonna launch uh, Bill's uh, uh, sky trackers once a week, every week for the next two months. The students will learn about the atmosphere and anyone on the planet can follow these things. So it'll be really exciting. So uh, Bill, why don't you go ahead and share one of your videos with us? Okay, all right, let's see here. Let me get to the share screen. And he's, as he's getting that set up at the uh, top of the hour, we're going to have uh, Lori Waters, a teacher from uh, Florida, will have a student talking about our Leguminot Challenge, in which we're selecting a next plant to send to space on our ExoLab 8 mission in the fall. Okay, can you see that uh, video now? Yep. Okay, this is at uh, Mill Creek Elementary School. This is their fifth grade class. And I gotta tell you, there are very few people smarter than these fifth graders. So uh, the teacher does a great job of teaching them about space and science. And uh, they even knew who the second person who landed on the moon was, although several of them thought it was Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> so, um, but they actually knew uh, who was in the command module, uh, Michael Collins, one of them knew that. So that's pretty impressive for the fifth grade. So they uh, ask college level questions. So you got to be prepared for that. So I'm going to play the launch uh, showing how excited these students get. And this is using one of those uh, bigger balloons with one of my sky trackers, uh, using one of those SBS 13 uh, Balloons from Scientific Balloon Solutions. And you can see how excited they are. Now I've got another short little video, if I can find it. And Ready to go. Yeah, well, Bill's finding that. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested in these, you need a ham radio license. Uh, barring that, uh, you know, your local radio uh, club can help you, coordinate with you to do that. Uh, if you're close to where Bill is, I think, what's your radius there in terms of helping folks out? Oh, I'm, I'm in Huntsville, Alabama, northern Alabama, but uh, I can help people out probably a 200 mile radius. But I know people in um, just about every state of the United States, I can help you uh, find somebody uh, to... Uh, yeah, Bill, I'm over here in Atlanta. I'm already thinking I need to uh, launch one of these from the backyard uh, and uh, stream it to my students as they're uh, working on it. I think this is a I think this is really I have, cool. I have several people in Atlanta that uh, are, uh, let me get back to that screen here. Now, your delivery schedule has been a little askew. It's pretty hard with supply chain. You. Uh, we, we've had uh, some uh, uh, supply issues with uh, parts in uh, China lately, but uh, I've got enough now to, uh, to, uh, crank away pretty well so oh, there you go. I, I was fortunate Steve, enough you better <laughs> okay can you see that screen now sure can yes sir now to preface this uh considering uh this was in near atlanta this is near kennesaw we uh, that particular flight that you saw 
launched, developed a hole in the balloon because we probably had a little too much gas in it and you put too much free lift in it, it overpressures and uh, can pop a seam. So that's what happened on this particular one. We put a little too much lift in it. You have to be pretty accurate in the lift. Uh, uh, generally, what I do when I ship one out uh, for the foil uh, balloons, I put a little weight bag that is the lift plus the free lift that you need. And it's only three grams of free lift for a flight. That's more lift than the weight of the payload, in other words. I and think I actually have one of those here, Bill. Yeah, if you put more <laughs> than that in, um, the balloon will overpressure. So you want enough pressure that it maintains its volume even at night when you lose the solar heating. But if you put too much in, it's the it's going to pop during peak solar heating. So um, this particular one popped. So we changed our, our uh, student mission from the first uh, elementary school to go around the world to the first elementary school to deliver balloon mail to Georgia, mm. from Alabama to Georgia. So it landed my friend, uh, my friend uh, was a, uh, this landed five miles from my friend's house who has recovered a lot of our previous balloons. So he knows how to track them down. And he found it about 40 feet up in this tree in the front yard of a guy's house. He knocked on the door, talked to him. The fellow was the fire chief. <laughs> and he says, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do a little training exercise and bring the ladder truck out. <laughs> and so this is the very first recovery of a balloon via fire truck. <laughs> Ted, and you can talk about the recovery. Oh, sorry, don't want to. Win. Oh, oh, Liam, go right ahead. You were right there with yeah, us. Yeah, no. So just uh, yeah, recovery by the Orange County Harbor Patrol. <laughs> Sheriff <Right. Harbor laughs> Patrol. Share that story, Ted. Oh, there you go. Yes, uh, we have to. Uh, our, our our folks on the front line do incredible things, and when uh, when you're courteous and you let them know what's happening, or in this case, when you have the the, the fire chief right there. <laughs> Uh, we had launched something in, in LA and we thought for sure it was a latex balloon that was going to stay on the coast. And we even waited a couple hours to make sure the wind patterns were keeping us on shore. But that balloon would have none of it. It was actually heading off the coast. And uh, we had already contacted the, the county sheriff, uh, Orange County Sheriff, to let him know that we're going to be doing this balloon on the state and what have you. And so I just called the watch commander back and I said, um, you know, uh, stand down. Uh, it looks like this thing's going in the ocean. And I go, so, oh, oh, that's okay. We'll call the Harbor Patrol. <laughs> it was a training exercise. And literally that balloon might've been, it was 10 miles offshore. Liam, Tony and I are sitting there at the beach trying to see where this thing can't see that's too far offshore. It was in the water for maybe 10 minutes. And we get a little call back on my phone saying, we got your payload We're heading back to the Harbor. So we drove down to pick it up and it was like too much applause and fanfare. These guys are coming in with the, with the wind, right? And a bunch of young girls that were part of this, um, USC project called Project Payload. We're very excited to get that payload back. <laughs> so that was good. So thank you to those men and women uh, there on the front line. Uh, and I know their, their lives are uh, right now uh, being challenged uh, uh, and we thank them for that. And it's really, it's really a lighthearted opportunity when we can engage them in this way when things aren't so serious. Uh, and I think they enjoy it too. That's a great story, Bill. Uh, I have a... Um... Uh, trying to get to my other video here in just a second. Uh, I can't get that. Yeah, can't. Greg and Mike, uh, if you guys are sticking around for a little bit at the top of the hour, we will have Lori Waters here with her students. I think that'd be a great chance for you to say hello to them. And they're going right. to be having a, a, a session, a discussion panel on our Lagoon Challenge. So that's what's going I can't on. get rid of that. Uh... Sounds good, Ted. Oh, Let me. Uh, Ted, try... why Bill is working on this. Um, yes. One of the things we had thought about um, in, in scouting was we were trying to do these right. balloon launches. Uh, everybody do them on the same day at the same time and take some different uh, readings around the country. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've all thought about doing uh, with this network uh, to open this up? Especially we, I see uh, Trisha Crooks is on from uh, South Africa. Uh, with her oh, hi, Trisha. 
Uh, absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I know uh, Bill's got the knowledge. He's got the network. We've got the excitement enthusiasm. There's other folks out there that can assist us. I know Liam's down in LA. I'm sure he'll put something in the air. So uh, Earth Day, April 22nd, that's a little short, uh, but uh, could be later in the summer. Uh, the beautiful thing here is we don't actually need to congregate to do this, right? So yes. uh, it's a matter of just getting the supplies and equipment and planning it. Uh, it could be in the fall, uh, it could be next year. Uh, but uh, I don't like to over plan too much as you probably figured out by the email <laughs> correspondence this morning, Mike, but uh, uh, it's, uh, maybe some planning might be good for something big like that. Yeah, Mike, uh, thank you for uh, being flexible. Yeah, you know, so maybe this is something when school starts up again in the fall. Yeah. yeah. You know, a good way to launch a science project. You know, South Africa has uh, three of this. Yes. So, Bill, what do we got? What are we looking at here? This is a peak of balloon race. Okay. Can you see that okay? Yep, it's a little staggered, but it's coming in. This is in a very high wind. We did this at the Dayton Ham Radio Convention and we launched four Pico balloons to have a race. So we had different groups. And we had a lot of obstacles, very high winds. And we had astronaut Doug Wheelock uh, he waited until everybody else had flown so he, he could get it just perfect. You know, that's the NASA way, of course. So you see the astronaut, Doug Wheelock, there uh, watching everybody else launch so he could get it just right. And it's kind of scary. You see the power lines there. Okay, here's the astronaut, Doug Wheelock. He's getting ready to fly. I don't recommend launching these high winds. Okay, so here, here goes the NASA launch balloon. <laughs> so uh, what was the date uh, of that launch, Bill? Uh, May 18th of last year. Okay. So Wheels, uh, so Wheels came up from Houston, or he, he was up in uh, Cleveland then, wasn't he? But this is in Dayton. But I mean, he came down from Cleveland? Or right, right. Yeah. Okay. But you see it, his, his balloon snagged on the rear view mirror of an RV. So we gave him a do-over. <laughs> it's good to see even the professionals have to do a do-over. <laughs> uh, we weren't trained in balloon launches, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> good, good point. Yeah, well, these fighter pilots here, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's very experienced. Max, wow. were you and Wheels in the same class? <laughs> really? Uh, we're, yeah, we're the same class. Very good friends. I just spoke with him yesterday. Um, oh, you, and uh, yeah, he's an Army video. helicopter pilot. Yeah. Yeah, tell him you saw his launch techniques. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'll get a kick out of it. Well, he's used to beating the air into submission. <laughs> there you go. That's an interesting perspective. All these armchair uh, aeronautics <laughs> experts do like, no, do it here, step back. <laughs> the astronauts can run. Now watch his hand motions, he's very expressive. Watch carefully that power line. <laughs> That's what happens when you hit a power line. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you, Bill. So uh, back to Mike's uh, interest here. Uh, just thinking extemporaneously, why don't we uh, actually think about how we might do that? Let's uh, make a plan uh, for the fall of getting uh, different folks around the world together for a balloon launch, hmm. whether it's a sky tracker, whether it's a standard payload on a, on a latex balloon. 
Uh, Bill, what's your experience on coordinating something like that in terms of seasonality and wind conditions in the northern or southern hemisphere? Let me try and stop this video. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can. I'm gonna stop. Just I'll stop your sharing. Okay. Here I'll stop. It. There you go. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, what Mike go. there brought up was this idea of, hey, can we do, uh, let's do this. Uh, when would we want to do it? Uh, based on your experience of uh, weather and seasonality, both Northern and Southern Hemisphere, taking account our friends down in South Africa, when would you think would be a, a good opportunity or to begin considering what it might look like to fly? Okay, this is a worldwide, worldwide launch. single day. You know, within a spectrum of hours, I'm going to guess because, like, Gil, what time is it right now, Gil? It's, uh, it's getting close to 1 a.m. I would say um, the problem is the end of April and the beginning of May here is always a good time. And in the Southern Hemisphere, that would be their fall, which is always a great time because you usually get some good weather. And mm -hmm. our September and October are beautiful days to fly, usually. And that would be your September and October. So uh, I'd say Earth Day would probably be a good one. However, uh, that's going to be the peak of our coronavirus um, uh, infection rate, probably. And uh, so we, we would have to do, it would limit how many people can show up to a launch. So I don't know. You, you'll have to. Yeah, that's. We've got that near-term uh, uh, launch possibility at, say, April 22nd. We're planning to launch one of your sky trackers every week starting next week. Right. And unfortunately, for, for we will event, I'd say uh, let's do this plan on, like, the fall, September, to plan okay. accordingly. Yep. And uh, okay. um, that would also be the spring in the southern hemisphere, which would be a good time. Okay. Yeah, jumping about the in. Equinox. Um, from the southern hemisphere side, hi, it's uh, Trisha here hey, from South Africa. Trisha. Uh, <laughs> Hi guys, part of um, Shivar's uh, team with I Innovate, and um, yeah, if the fall for us, or the sorry, the September August time for us works a lot better because I think our schools will be closed for quite a while, um, and just accessibility to being able to follow the balloons is limited. So I think if we could plan for that, if it works for you guys, it would be an awesome time to have a bit of a build up and also follow your experiences, Ted and Tony, over the next few weeks and months um, and learn a little bit from you guys on how your launches go. I think that sounds like an amazing idea. How about Germany? Yosin, can we get that going? Yeah. <laughs> Anna. <laughs> yeah, you're on mute there. Yeah. Well, I think this would also allow us to get more publicity out there besides getting the equipment around to everybody so everybody has the same balloon or the same equipment that we're talking about. It would allow us to get more publicity out there, mm -hmm. whether it's um, local news or teachers associations or science mm -hmm. associations. Uh, having those extra six months, I think would make a huge difference for us. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And I can- Mike, you're gonna to need to join every one of these sessions if we're gonna get a project like this happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the time, having that time before the launches would be really valuable as well if we're gonna be doing this globally because uh, different countries have different regulations on yeah. what can go in the air, what time of the year. Uh, in Japan, there's been I've had run-ins with, with drones that th there are certain times they get very strict, um, even just toy uh, toy airplanes at times can be kind of strict. So I think having this time would be, uh, would give us the window to kind of research what can go up, when can it go up? So no one ends up ruffling any feathers that don't need to be ruffled. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, there you oh, go. you listen. Hi. <laughs> yes, I think in Germany it's also a very strict regulated and we are not allowed to fly uh, with with balloons here in Germany. Only uh, little drones with not more than uh, 300 grams. We can fly 20 meters high and not more. 
Now, uh, Poland has a very active uh, uh, HAB group, both Pico Balloons, uh, Czechoslovakia, I mean, Czecho, Czechia, and Slovakia, they have a very active group too. I know some ham radio uh, balloon uh, people in Germany, and I'll find out what they do to fly because they have flown. Uh, but I'm have to find out what uh, what they have to do to get permission to fly. So mm -hmm. I will let you know on that. Uh, but I have two friends in Germany who uh, who have flown Pico balloons uh, successfully, and also the bigger Hab balloons. In fact, uh, during the eclipse in 1997, there was a big group. Uh, um, I think they were in uh, Stuttgart uh, that they flew a uh, large balloon. So it is possible, but uh, you have to look at the regulations. Um, yes, I think. For the launch. Um, Great Britain, uh, you cannot fly an amateur radio transmitter um, in anything that flies, uh, be it a RC aircraft or a drone or high altitude balloon. Uh, so what they do in Great Britain is they use the license-free uh, band on the, in UHF. Um, so um, that's one restriction if we fly from the Great Britain that they, uh, I actually have to draw uh, a box around the United Kingdom. Um, and when my uh, GPS says that I'm within that box, it stops transmitting. Wow. Mm -hmm. And the other two countries where I have to avoid transmitting, are and of course, North Korea, because I don't want to start World War III. It's called geo <laughs> draw a box uh, of coordinates, and then you look to see if you're within that box in that polygon. So, uh, you're writing all that in uh, on your Arduino code there in C++? Well, a friend of mine came up with a, an integer-based uh, version of that polygon code, which is usually in floating point, because you really don't need it to be accurate to a few feet, uh, as long as you're within a mile or two and give your little buffer, uh, draw your box a little more than a mile away from the coastline. Um, the integer base works great. Right. So, um, but all my uh, trackers, uh, have that code in there to avoid transmitting over those sensitive areas. And it also uh, tells me when to transmit uh, on different frequencies because on the VHF um, frequencies, the um, you have to change to different countries because they have a different network frequency on each. Um, uh, basically, Europe is on a different frequency than China. South Korea and Japan. Mm -hmm. So I have to switch frequency whenever I'm over those particular areas. And the United States is totally different as well. In the Southern Hemisphere, there's five different other frequencies. So I have 10 different frequencies I have to shift to. Uh, and I just draw a box around each of those uh, countries and those regions. And I know when <laughs> to to what frequency. <laughs> That's amazing. That's something I didn't know. You have all that crammed into your code inside the little sky tracker. It's pretty dense. <laughs> wow. It's oh, like, yeah, I'm just trying. We oh, have K in that uh, Arduino. Yeah, that I know. That's uh, <laughs> that's very to... elegant, right? It's like uh, you have to know what you're doing when you have a little, very limited space to do it in. That's really amazing, and that's why you don't share your code, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't share my code because it's pretty messy right now. It looks like my garage. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I think it's quite organized. Bill, thank you so much for the, the journey into the stratosphere and your knowledge, your 30 plus years experience doing this. And I think Mike uh, Lepresti has challenged us to think about what we can do in the fall with doing a worldwide uh, high altitude balloon launch for uh, parents, teachers, students, the enthusiasts, uh, the way to, for us to kind of come together and engage, perhaps celebrate the end of uh, this uh, notorious thing that uh, we're all dealing with right now. So. What I did notice is Lori's popped in from Florida. So, hey, Lori. Uh, now, we've got some of your students joining us as well. How's that going to work out? Uh, yes, hopefully they'll be signing on with us in uh, just a couple of minutes. I've got five students that I, I think are going to join us and have a student panel discussion about some of their research. Fantastic. I think we're going to have Michael Wilkinson, our lead uh, teacher, join us in that. Uh, I want to introduce uh, two guests that kind of join us at the last minute. Mike Lepresti and uh, retired astronaut Greg Johnson. Uh, so guys, thank you for jumping in and joining us here. 
-hmm. And we have really, um, we have some worldwide presence. Uh, we've got Gil from Osaka, Japan, uh, Shivar and Trisha from South Africa, uh, Yosin and uh, Anna is still here from uh, Germany. And so, and of course, a lot hey, of us- Don't forget the Canada. Canada. Yeah, yeah, we've got Diane. <laughs> there you go. Okay, hold on, I'm getting through there. There's too many people on the screen. <laughs> Normally it's like uh, Hollywood squares. We've got nine folks or so, but it's, so I have to kind of scroll to see everybody. So, yeah, it's good to see There's Canada. another like, teacher teacher from Germany. It's Bernhard Grenig from Lich from the- Oh, fantastic. Also, awesome. is, is also in, uh, I sent him the data. Uh -huh. And I think he's also in Bernhard. Bernhard. He's, Bernhard. Uh, I see him there. Yeah, I see yeah. that he's present. Fantastic. And of course, this is all being streamed through YouTube as well. So I don't know who's on that. This will be a recorded session. So this is really exciting. And Greg, while well, we've got you, I mean, thank you so much. Uh, can you just share a little bit with us some of the experiences? I see Liam Kennedy there. He's part of ISS Above. He's got a live view of Earth from the International Space Station. Now, I think you're the only guy that's in here that's had a view like that firsthand. So Craig, why don't you share a little bit about your experience and uh, uh, for our teachers and if there are any students on what's going on. You there. bet, Ted. Um, you might have noticed I uh, switched to my iPad. So there, I was fumbling around there a little bit uh, earlier because uh -huh. for some reason my camera on my laptop is just not very high fidelity. But uh, being on the, on the space station was a spiritual experience. Uh, the photographs and the uh, videos that you see just don't do it justice. We live on such a beautiful planet. And uh, as we zip around the earth every 90 minutes, uh, you know, of course at a 51.6 inclination, uh, we see 95% of our populated land masses. And there are so many beautiful places uh, on our planet. And so when I talk to kids and adults alike uh, about the experience, um, it's, it's, it's life-changing because it, helps us realize that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. this, this pandemic that we're experiencing right now underscores how uh, we're, we're globally interconnected. And it's important to take care of our spaceship Earth, but also take care of um, uh, our crewmates. Uh, and it also underscores the importance of being a crew, crew member, somebody who goes into quarantine and isn't just a passenger along for the ride. And so it's important for us all to stick together. And uh, this, this situation that we're in underscores that. I'll say one other thing about the pandemic uh, analogy is that we're now all in isolation and we're um, communicating uh, using AV. And, and that's of course how we have to do it when we're in space. Uh, and, and you obviously are isolated for, in Doug Wheelock's case, six months at a time. Uh, with me, my flights were short. They were about 16 days each. So I'll stop there. Yeah, but you you had a pretty important role there assembling this thing, right? Working on getting it all put together. Yeah, I, I was on a couple of the space shuttle missions toward the end of the program, uh, both times aboard Endeavor. Uh, we had the final flight of Endeavor, actually. Uh, first time, we took up a Japanese uh, module, and then the second time, uh, we took up the uh, AMS. We took up other stuff too, but those were the primary payloads. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really and, cool. and talk about uh, distance uh, learning. You and Taz played uh, chess with with uh, who, who was it on the ground? I can't. I don't recall now. Hal Bogner from the the chess federation. But uh, yeah, Mark Kelly made us do it during our uh, you know off schedule time. We couldn't schedule that uh, in the regular flight plan. But it was a it was an interesting experience. We made a couple moves a day, and uh, ended up uh, down two pawns when we landed. So that was a lot of a lot of fun. Wow! Uh, all right. So I'm wearing my. Uh, so for those that one of your other projects box was was uh, Casus. You were the the first uh, director, right? Uh, I was the second one second, actually. Maybe. Yeah. Um, well, I guess you got really the third because there, there, were, there was an interim for about a year before I joined. But yeah, I was with them for almost five years. And that was quite an experience, uh, mm -hmm. trying to use the space station differently and attract um, innovative, non-traditional users, uh, you know, as well as the, 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 the um, pathways that NASA had, had uh, worked on for a decade and a half. So. And uh, CASIS was, it, it is the Center for Advancement of Science and Space, uh, funded by NASA with con through Congress. And it's uh, had a name change. It's now the US National Laboratory on the ISS. And without the National Laboratory, without CASIS, 
our Exalab project would not exist uh, through, uh, through their support and working with a company called Space Tango. So big shout out to Space Tango. I don't see any of their engineers on. Uh, they were on our session last week. Um, we would not be able to run these experiments, sending a single payload up, uh, really kind of like intermodal transportation for space. Instead of a 40 foot container on the back of a truck or on a rail car or on a ship, these little 10 centimeter cubes here uh, are kind of like the building blocks or intermodal transportation. Fill it up with uh, some interesting science. In this case, we use a 2U equivalent. We send that up and then that's how we're able to get all our students that worked around the world with those experiments. So number seven has just concluded. It's been a bag waiting to come home. And I guess number eight is what we've been talking about. The re one of the primary uh, reasons for putting these conferences together. And uh, Lori Waters here, I think that's a good segue. Uh, there in Florida has got some of her students online. And you guys are really lucky. We've got uh, astronaut Greg Johnson in here. So you might have a question or two for him. But we also want to make sure that we spend some time and, and focus on your panel discussion for the legumes. So while I do know that uh, well, Mike and, and, and Greg are here, if you've got some questions or thoughts uh, to, to uh, someone that's been out there looking at Earth and the ISS right now live, uh, I'd say there's a chance to ask a question. So we're gonna change up a little bit what you might have in programming in your head. And uh, here's a chance to ask firsthand uh, our, as we think about your generation is really the Martian generation, right? We've got the Artemis project. We'll have the first uh, female on the surface of the moon. And with Gateway, I think uh, SpaceX was just announced as one of the first uh, uh, um, uh, contract award winners to supply missions to the Gateway, which is essentially the next generation international space station, except it's in orbit around the moon. So in the next two decades, you guys here uh, in middle school, high school, uh, will be uh, uh, that same generation we're going to see on the surface of Mars. It might be you, or probably more than likely, no, you guys, someone that you know as well. Uh, so that's really exciting. So while well, Greg's here, maybe you have a thought or question for him. Make sure your, uh, uh, your mic's not on mute if you want to speak up. Kayla, I'll just jump in here. So I invited a, a few of my students um, from my um, honors biology classes. And um, so these are ninth grade students we have. And uh, they, uh, they knew my love of space uh, the first day when I wore my uh, flight suit from uh, space camp uh, to class. And uh, we approached it as uh, we're on this spaceship together for the next nine months uh, learning about science. And um, how all these different um, topics you would normally think, oh, well, biology, it's just all this life science right here on Earth, but there's so much that's applicable to, um, uh, to space science uh, and uh, how all of these are interrelated, the physics and the chemistry and the biology part of it. And so um, maybe if uh, you guys could uh, talk about uh, your experience uh, in high school science and was there a particular time or teacher that really sparked your interest and curiosity that um, drove you to pursue what you did? Kayla, um, looks like you're going to say something. Actually, Hello. hi. <laughs> um, actually, like, Miss Waters class actually inspired me to do a lot of the new science stuff that I've actually been working with. Um, our latest science fair, I had been working, me and my partner had been working with an aquaponic system, which really, which really inspired me and made me want to pursue that, especially Miss Waters' like love and passion for all this different stuff and just incorporating different things into science. Like a lot of the people that I talked to who had taken biology in previous years, they're like, oh, it's like, it's really easy. It's just so boring. Like, you're gonna get like plants out of it. But like, I've gotten so much more than that. And just like all the other connections that's kind of inspired me to do more stuff with this and kind of like impacted my view on science this year, especially. Thank you so much, Lori, for being such a great teacher. So Greg, do you, re do you remember your uh, middle school, early high school days and ninth grade biology or? I, I do, I, I loved science. Uh, but uh, my, the, 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 probably the biggest mentor who personally took an interest in me was my math teacher. And he pulled me out and individually uh, uh, wowed me with all kinds of different uh, math stuff. But uh, you can't, can't specialize in everything as a kid. I was very interested in biology, but, but I have several teachers who had a real influence on me. 
and uh, and, I, and I've spoken with them recently. Uh, you know, teachers, they change the world um, one child at a time. My wife's a kindergarten teacher. She's up there teaching right now, which is why my bandwidth is not perfect as I manipulate these pictures. Greg, Greg you're a yeah, musician so also. So, how, I mean, how, how do, you, do you think that, that that's added to, uh, you know, your presence in terms of space science and mathematics and all the different things you've done? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, Mr. DePiro was my math teacher, or I'm sorry, my uh, band leader. Uh, his wife, unfortunately, just passed away a, a few weeks ago, but we're still in contact. And uh, you learn discipline, you learn teamwork, leadership. Uh, so, uh, yes, a lot of my musical background uh, was handy and, and useful throughout my life. Mm -hmm. you know, Greg, I'm glad you, you really focused on the role our teachers play. We have our Right now with this pandemic, we have our frontline hospital workers, we have police and fire. They've got their lives on the line right now. Uh, we're in the education space at Magnitude uh, and we realize the incredible pressure that educators are in really around the world. I mean, they have so many different people that they're reporting to, right? Uh, they've got their own families on top of everything else, but you've got administration that's now asking them to reinvent the way they teach in a classroom setting because now your students are spread all around the town. Uh, you've got uh, uh, te uh, parents. Uh, some parents are really engaged. They want to know what their kid's going to do this morning or this afternoon, or they may not even been able to reach the parent. Uh, and then you have the students themselves. And I know the most um, passionate teacher really wants to know how their uh, how, how their student is doing. Uh, and during this time, the, especially for the, some of those students that really need that extra care and attention, you know, how is that working? And so, to me, I think what's happening in this in this situation around the world is it's like a massive tsunami is hitting us right now. Uh, and we're dealing with that. But when this recedes, when this all comes back, we're gonna see the flotsam of society and all the things that were the inequities and the injustices are showing themselves right now. And I think it's an opportune, uh, opportune time for the planet to really think about what we're doing and what is normal and what we consider the day-to-day -day normal life. Is it really normal? Uh, and it's a good chance to think to reboot the way we think about how we live together amongst ourselves. I'm so happy to have everyone here from around the world, whether it's Japan or Canada or, you know, where's our friends from Mexico? They didn't join us today. So maybe we'll pop in a little later, uh, but let's get back to, to our students yeah. here. Um, <laughs> or are they in? Uh, but let's get back to our students, Lori, and uh, get us back on track a little bit. Cause I know they want to uh, talk about their legumes. So Michael Wilkinson, maybe if you could lead us through that investigation and Lori, I'll let you kind of kick it off to make sure that I'm keeping us on track. So the, the Leguminot Challenge, we are asking our students and teachers around the world to give us suggestions for what legume we should fly on our mission eight, which right now is uh, gonna fall, uh, launch in the, in the fall. Um, we flew cowpeas uh, in, the, in the original flight this, this winter with their symbiont rhizobium. And so we're looking to see if we can, uh, if, if these plants can, can carry out that symbiotic relationship with the bacteria, fix nitrogen, and potentially uh, help us be sustainable uh, um, both on earth, but in space, if we can actually do some cropping. And Dr. Alan Stofan is gonna join us a little bit later, talk about the geology of Mars and gardening on Mars and whether or not that's actually possible. Um, so, uh, 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 Laurie, if you can have your students tell us a little bit about their experiment, um, how you got into, I think you guys did kidney beans, uh, why that was your choice, uh, and just, you know, some of, some of the things you learned and uh, surprises that you had along the way. All right, sure. So uh, in my AP environmental science class, we started with this lab back in the fall where we took uh, lima beans and kidney beans and sunflower seeds was what they originally chose. And the original experiment started with the salt tolerance. And so they took uh, the, the beans and the seeds and they put them in Petri dishes. And the goal was, uh, will they begin to germinate uh, it, depending on the level of salt content. And, and that's really important with Mars because we know the regolith is high in salt content. 
Right, and the Mars regolith, Martian regolith um, has perchlorates in it, which tends to be very toxic. And so there's going to have to be a way to remove those perchlorates from the soil. Uh, I ordered some Martian simulant and um, it's, it's, very, it's very much like clay, very fine grained, and um, it's, uh, not, it, it's, it doesn't have nutrients in it. And uh, we tried to grow some things in it and there is our dead plant. Um, from our Martian simulant when we did nothing to the soil. Uh, when we then um, took a few different uh, types of seeds, I'll get back to the beans in just a second, but I'll go ahead and show these. So this is a cucumber uh, plant that uh, we grew in the Martian simulant, uh, but we started, it was really struggling in the beginning. And so we started using hydroponic uh, nutrient solution to get it to grow but it just really pales in comparison uh, when you grow it in the peat um, earth type soil. So it's We lost your audio. From the roots very easily. Um, but hopefully this is a, a sign that we would be able to ultimately treat Martian soil uh, regolith to become soil, but it's definitely lacking some things um, and particularly that uh, the beneficial microbes is uh, um, as far as we know life, uh, there is no life on Mars that we've detected yet. And so to use that Martian regolith, we will have to add some things to the soil. So this investigation of looking at the different types of bacteria um, will, is going to be key fundamental research for going forward for space crops, because ultimately we will need to provide food for the astronauts and explorers on Mars. And it's such a far journey. They do not want to eat packaged food that's five years old. Wouldn't it be so much better to eat something fresh? Okay. You, you so, want to weigh in on that, Greg? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I was only there 16 days and um, I was getting a little bit tired of some of some of the food that that we were eating. We couldn't have fresh produce after it spoiled in a few days. Right. So uh, I I think this veggie program and all the plant uh, research that's being done is critical when we start putting together these uh, multi year missions. It will be absolutely critical from a health standpoint, from a morale standpoint, from an emotional standpoint. Mm -hmm. So bravo. Great. <laughs> so let me bring up, this is, our, this is our bean plant that did survive our earlier salt experiment. Um, the students determined after the first couple of days with the, uh, the salt tolerance that it, it started to smell really bad in We lost your audio. Laura, you're dropping out. You might need to move closer to your Wi-Fi. Floor through it. And so um, they took uh, them out speak up. and they put them um, into uh, soil and uh, they started growing. Um, the controls obviously grew the best because they were not um, affected. There was no salt to, to kill them off. A couple of the other ones, very low, um, I think it was a quarter percent of uh, saline solution, those grew okay. But then we came into the classroom one day and uh, we noticed that the leaves um, had all these white spots on them. And we're like, whoa, wait a minute, something is happening to our, our poor bean plants. And um, we abandoned the rest of our lesson for the day. And we had to then dive in and determine what's killing our bean plants. And um, one of the students discovered um, in looking under the microscope at some of the samples that it was spider mites that had attacked the plant. And so then they had to look up for the solution of how to get rid of the spider mites. They had all like infested in the soil. And I mean, they were just everywhere. So they took them out of the soil. Um, they washed the roots off and then they put it in a, a, a perlite um, to kind of try to grow it hydroponically. And uh, ultimately, uh, most of the plants did not uh, survive that part of the experiment. Uh, but this one, this one did. 
And so this is our, our survivor here. Oh, Lori. <laughs> up. And, uh, you know, I like to use things from around the house. So I've got yogurt cups and I've got water bottles cut up and all kinds of recyclable things um, to repurpose and reuse. I, I staked my hydroponic plants um, two nights ago using chopsticks and plastic knives and straw. Wonderful. Lori? Just so you know, your your being uh, your media is a little intermittent, so your audio has dropped it a couple times. I don't think she hears it. Yeah. Maybe some of the some students live in the soil, in the but they don't uh, in, infect or create do the nitrogen fixation process until they actually infect the plant, infect those roots, and get in there, and so. Um, I'm gonna change the direction of my computer over here and see if we can open up uh, and look at some of the roots of this plant, see if there's any nodules. There may not be, but maybe Michael can help us out. Yeah, I've got a, a specimen here that I think at least has pre-nodules, so I'll, I'll prep okay, it while you're doing you that. grab that and I'll get this one set yeah. up. So students, and can Lori, some of you can, weigh in so on, you know. on just this experience and, and what what you've gotten out of it? Let's see who's on. I think Caleb and Josh and uh, Kayla might be on. So we have a few. So yep. one of you can try. Go ahead. Josh, go ahead. So I actually didn't do this experiment because I just got here in January. So when we start, so when they started this experiment back in November, um, I never participated in it. Who has it been coming in late on it? It's been okay, actually. Ms. Waters has explained everything to me. She explained the spider mite problem to me, and she's actually done a very good job of letting me know what's going on and what's going on about the whole thing. And Josh, which um, which legume did you um, decide in your research? I did the soybeans. Okay, so he's on team soybean. What have you found so far about uh, in your soybean research? So soybeans, they're very... They're very hardy plants. They do not have a long grow time for space. I mean, if you can survive 45 to 65 days on packaged food, you'll be fine. They, they do require um, a fairly medium temperature, so you'll be fine. It's about 70 degrees, so it's a little bit on the cooler side, but you're, that should be a, a fairly average temperature. And they grow about 12 to 18 inches tall. So that may be a problem, but I'm sure you could find a way to do that somehow where they wouldn't grow as tall. How, how did you find the germination of them? Because I've been have, not having a great time with germinating my soybeans. They're... So I actually just started this research um, like two or three days ago. Yeah. So I've not been able to acquire soybeans. Okay. Especially well, with everything going on. So I do apologize for that. Well, Lori will have a few soybeans soon. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, my, they're, those are not doing well. So they're just rotting on me. So I'm not, I've not found the right key in terms yeah. of germination. Yeah, so right now, um, last week, uh, the students in all of my classes uh, started with the project of doing initial research on the different types of legumes. And they had to pick one to further pursue. And so uh, they kind of did a comparison chart to begin with and then selected one to move forward in a final project. So they'll be creating digital posters um, summarizing all of their research and their current portion of the project is to look at the relationship specifically of the rhizobium and the um, legume. Are there specific types of uh, rhizobium bacteria that are better for certain legumes because that could make a difference. And so they're, they're doing that research now um, to try and identify the down to the bacteria, which is going to be the best one for the soybean or the chickpea. 
and uh, then find some images and diagrams uh, showing how that this process happens, uh, that symbiotic relationship. Um, Kayla, do you want to talk about uh, yours, uh, what you've found so far? And then I'll start looking at sure. the nodules of this plant. Yes. Okay. So um, for my bean, I picked the mung bean, which is the, um, so like it was like looking at the different like food that you could make with this, it had a bunch of like nutritional values and it was very high in protein and like different things, which was really good. Um, learning that like germination periods was like, it's a little longer, which kind of was um, somewhat concerning, but I think most of the germination after it's germinated, it's um, very easy to transport. And like looking at the new rhizobium information that I had been researching, um, learn I learned that um, certain strains of rhizobium can help um, the mung bean build a tolerance to osmotic stress, which allows it to like, you know, go between different liquids and it makes it very easy to transport and like move around. Cause usually like when you're moving like beans and different plants, like from different um, levels of water or um, different concentrations that it could like mess it up or like, I don't know, um, hurt the plant in some way and stunt its growth. But because of the rhizobium's effect on the mung bean, it allows it to build a tolerance to this osmotic stress, which is very good. And, um, and especially like just being able to like sustain a lot of things, I feel like it'd be very easy to transport and survive on um, various in various different places as well. Have you been able to test that at all? I have uh, not. We we have not really been, none of these projects have really been able to access any of the legumes that we are working with right now. So we'll have to, uh, we'll have to work with, together with Lori and, and see if we can develop some of these, these experiments that you have to, you know, to test out these ideas of the, the tolerance and everything. Mm -hmm. It looks like yeah, originally when we thought we would only have till about April 17th or the middle of um, April, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to pull off experimenting with them. But um, it sounds like, uh, Ted and Michael, your, your deadline might stretch out a bit, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's still in discussion right now. We're okay. looking at optimizing the payload itself, in okay. which case uh, that's still kind of in discussion. If we want to add some interesting things our researchers are doing, like Gil in Japan and Dr. Barker from the Gilroy lab, uh, then uh, we probably want to do some modifications, in which case we might move that slide a little later. But speaking of which, I just want to give a shout out. I saw Trent Smith from NASA join us with Veggie. Trent, thank you for popping on. And also we have some colleagues from Mexico that popped in as well. So great to see you guys as well. We really do have the international crew here today. Canada, South Africa, uh, uh, Little Hesse, Germany there. Um, and of course, uh, Canada and a lot of us here in the U.S. So exciting so we're looking for uh like, not this, just here this is like the coolest brady bunch introduction ever just saying i'm like looking at this on my computer it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah right now uh, Lori looks appears to be analysis position yeah it's hard to tell of who's who's where they keep changing uh, Michael, what have you uh, what have you found in yours there? I've definitely got some nodules here. I'm just uh, getting the microscope positioned, and I'll I'll broadcast that in a moment. Okay, I I've looked pretty thoroughly at mine here, and I don't see any yet. It's possible that it just hasn't had time, and um, uh, some people okay. inoculate their seeds uh, before. Um, before planting them. Um, have you ever tried to inoculate roots once they're established? Yeah, I actually have. Uh, in fact, that's what this, I think this one was done that way. I don't have okay. the, the lot number on it, so I can't be sure which procedure this one did. But the, also I pre-germinate um, and find that that works really well. And then you can inoculate this, the, um, the young seedling um, because it's, it's a really cool physiology. The, the, the um, root hairs actually curl around. Well, first they attract the rhizobium and then they curl around the, um, the, the root hairs will curl around the rhizobium and that's where the nodule develops. So it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, reaction at the cellular level and you know, the, everything about it. So um, let's see if I can broadcast this. Um, But by the time 
you've got your second set of trifoils, they should be nodulating. And Ted, I um, hate to tell you, Greg and I have to jump for another uh, set of calls here uh, at half past. Oh, um, Mike, Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, see if, if we can join that's... another week too. Absolutely. Oh yeah, so, that'd be great guys. We are kind of <laughs> making this up as we go along. Uh, you've got to see some of our first ones. We had this three hour, uh, really, if I, the best I can describe it is improvisational jazz discussion of, of data science and microbiology with Dr. Richard Barker in the first session. Uh, it's three hours of really engaging conversation, but we're building the programming out. It's going to run through here in the end of June. I would love you guys to be the focus of the conversation. And so please, let's find a time where it's convenient for you guys to join us on a Friday, anywhere from, you know, it could be as early as seven o'clock Pacific or 10 Eastern uh, on up to the afternoon or even the evening. And I know our colleagues there closer to the GMT, the UTC, plus or minus a couple hours, we're probably going to set a session up for them. And then our Southeast Asian friends and uh, folks in Japan want to probably set something up more akin to their time zones. Like you guys like Gil here in one thirty in the morning joining us, which is great. So please uh, reach out if you've got some time or if you've got some friends that you think would be great to have on here. We're really what we want to do is we want to rally around our, our educators as they're really reinventing the way they've been teaching and their students are at a distance to them. So can we come up and enjoy and create engaging experiences and conversations? Our focus is on ExoLab 8, what's coming up. The legume challenge is at no cost, and it's just a lot of fun. Our youngest kids will just be doing art or poetry or what have you, and our, hopefully our older uh, students, like what we have here today, will be doing actual research. So we're super excited that you guys could join us. And uh, coming up on the top of the hour, I think we actually have um, Dr. Stefan from, uh, uh, was a chief scientist at NASA, uh, and uh, uh, now at the um, National Air and Space Museum in DC. She's yeah, she was, the, she, was the, she was the chief scientist of all of NASA. I mean, really high level scientist. I'm really excited she's going to be on. Yeah. I wish I could be on uh, w when she joins, but, uh -huh. uh, but I, uh, I, I'm, I have another meeting that I actually, I told them I'd be five minutes late. I just want to thank you and Ted, Ted for pulling, and Tony for pulling this together. Lori, you're such a motivated uh, science teacher yes. and such a model uh, for, for all. And kids, thank you for joining. I know you all didn't get to talk, but um, what you're doing is uh, you're, you're learning during a very historic event right now. This, this is a period of time that we'll look back and we'll remember. And, uh, and so you're part of a bigger initiative. And it's really uh, interesting uh, how, how we're evolving our learning so quickly. So uh, be curious, learn whatever you can, ask lots of questions, and uh, hopefully I'll see you again some other time. So see you all later. Thanks so much, Greg. Thank, right, you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for Thank you. Bye now. You guys have a great afternoon. All right. So uh, this is great, Michael. This is your view here with the with your scope. Yeah. Yeah. So these are two of the of the nodules um, that formed with the rhizobium and the and the root hairs. Um, so the 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 rhizobium actually infects the roots of the plant and then this transitions from being a, a pathogen uh, infection to a symbiosis where the, the rhizobium are fixing the nitrogen in the atmosphere, converting it into ammonia and then into the nitrates and nitrites that the plants are able to metabolize, um, getting the whole nitrogen compounds into the entire ecosystem that we all need. Uh, then the, in exchange, the, the plant is feeding the rhizobium sugars, carbon compounds. So it's a, it's a, totally um, uh, fair exchange. Um, so it's, that's, it's a pretty exciting um, um, reaction. The whole ecosystem depends on it. And this is our idea in terms of, of the, the farming sustainably on earth and also on, on, in space to not, in space we can't use the chemical fertilizers that, that we use here on earth. Um, they're very expensive to produce, dangerous to produce. And then we've got all the upmass. So if we can actually use this as a means of creating a, a soil, um, you know, I'd be very interested on your on your salt com, uh, salt concentrations, um, students. That is, 
is one more one species of legume more salt tolerant than another and how high of a level can they tolerate do they change the salinity of the soil as they're growing um, all kinds of questions like that that i'd really be curious about the answers to because that might help us select uh, the best candidates to fly Another thought I had on that is um, I've got I'm going to use my Martian uh, simulant and I'm going to run some uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium tests uh, soil tests on them and then plant different uh, crops together. So uh, in my little outdoor garden space here I've um, put in some of the tomato sphere tomatoes with uh, the green beans and some of the peas and then different, uh, the lettuce and the kale and the spinach uh, as well to, um, to see what happens when we mix some of these and test the nitrogen, phosphorus and, and potassium soil um, level changes um, to see how, you know, maybe if I have a Martian simulant here and I have uh, legumes uh, growing in with the tomatoes, will that uh, be beneficial for both plants? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to take this, as you were, you were saying, Michael, um, in, in growing and germinating the different ones and, and testing in different ways. So uh, hopefully the, the students will still find uh, this in, engaging as we create these videos and, and little experiments here. Uh, if we could give uh, Caleb, I know you're on um, as well, if you want to chime in about the research that you've done. I know you have to get on to a, an English uh, a webinar in just a few minutes. So want to talk about what you found out so far? Yes, so um, I did alfalfa as my legume because it grows quickly um, in like seven to ten days I think and it doesn't need much soil, only like half an inch of soil to grow correctly. Um, it can withstand drought and cold so it's pretty resilient um, and it has been found with rhizobium so that's the one I chose. Cool. One of our uh, our our rhizob or our um, alfalfa lead was on earlier this morning, but she's she's gone off now. Are you are you talking about me, Mike? No, you're our soybean lead. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that your yeah, your class, Lori, picking different beans. That's fantastic. Different legumes. Yeah. Oh, Wait. Ruby, I see Ruby, you are on. Do you want to chime in? All right, so um, I did my research on lentils, um, which is the oldest legume crop. They are cool season legumes and um, they are also drought resistant. Um, I basically researched like the ties and how it like reacts to the rhizobium. Um, it usually um, grows a certain amount of um, percentages compared to if it was just growing by itself. It also, um, because it's known for its protein and its carbs and its calories, um, the rhizobium also helps lift those protein levels, which would be good for those who are eating it. Great. Hello. Oh. Hello. I'm Bernard from Germany. Uh, Germany, you understand me? Yes. Hello. Uh, we begin with the experiments uh, next week, and we take uh, the alfalfa plants too, like uh, like Rachel Klein, because it's a very interesting plant. She needs not so much water. Has a very long history. She comes uh, in former times. I think more than 2000 years from the Iran, from Persian, and uh, goes to Greece and uh, goes to Germany. And uh, she's very robust uh, against cl climate. So we begin this the next week in Germany with the uh, alfalfa. We say in Germany with the uh, Luzern plants. Cool. Awesome. Well, good deal. <laughs> We're getting a little competition here, people. What team are you on, right? <laughs> yeah. so, sorry, I, I always I uh, want to get my picture on this uh, computer, but I cannot do it. <laughs> sorry. So you, you know, you're here on me. Come back on next week. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll set up something a little more uh, conducive to your time zones for sure. 
I know our friends in Kenya and South Africa, along with you in, in Europe, uh, would probably like to have a little different time to do these. So we'll set up a different time zone for you guys. And Kiel, we're not forgetting you in there in Osaka. <laughs> okay, so I'll come back for you too. Yeah, so just, uh... That's awesome. All right, so Lori, do you have, I see you might have some other students online as well. Am I missing anyone? I really what? like uh, that they're diversified in their thinking and their arguments and reasons behind the, the plant of their choice. Uh, the research begins now, right? You know, I guess one benefit, if we do extend the mission and launch a little later, this gives us a chance for those ground trials, which are so critical, and that feedback and the investigations that your students have, and they might be working with one and realizing that they'd rather consider based on what their findings are from the other students to look at this other opportunity as well. So as we collectively do this in this kind of creative way, uh, scientifically and creatively, I think it'll be really important to see those outcomes. So uh, we'll be convening at Magnitude here to determine our actual flight. We're looking at the North Grumman flight in August, then the SpaceX 21 flight here in October. We're tag toggling between those two. It might be beneficial to even maybe hold it off a little bit longer if, um, if the Gilroy lab and, and the work that Gil's doing there in Japan uh, requires us to maybe modify our lab a little bit, which I think it sounds like we may want to do for the benefit of uh, microscopy or something else like that. So we're mm -hmm. pretty interested mm -hmm. in making sure we do it right for you guys. Also, I, I, I want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Anna from uh, Germany. She is uh, now working on uh, translating uh, all the lessons uh, for the Luminar uh, challenge uh, to German. Um, so hope, um, hopefully, um, uh, you know, more school in uh, Germany uh, can, um, can uh, jump on board. Anna, you want to talk a little bit about uh, your process on um, translating and also um, the school system uh, in Germany a little bit? Uh, kind of, I can try, I think, but for the school system, Jochen or even Bernhard would be like better to talk about. Um, yeah, I just try to translate the lessons in the Legume, Legume Now Challenge as fast as I can. So um, hopefully some German teachers and some more German schools will get on board. Um, I think it's a good opportunity during the COVID-19 crisis to teach children and to um, also transfer knowledge in an interesting way and an online way, which is now essential. Right. Yes. So, and it's just amazing what you're all doing, like all the students who are now on an like big Zoom call, you guys, Ted and Tony, and also Bill with the balloons. It was really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank awesome. You Thank us. you. Anna. As, yes, as I... Michael mentioned the other day, I think this is a real opportunity. While there's so many challenges with having to teach in this kind of environment, and all these teachers are trying to now figure out how to interact with students and create lesson plans that are still engaging. Um, but this is really a such an ideal time um, for project-based learning and to help students evolve in their thinking. Um, so many times in the classroom we see, you know, kids are coming in and maybe they just want, you know, it's simple questions. Here's a fact, here's remember the fact, pure memorization, and they're done. But that's not really how science uh, evolves and works. And so it's through projects like this that I think we can really engage them in more analytical and higher level thinking. Uh, than we could in a, in a typical classroom lesson um, or a traditional type of lesson. And so this is, I think, a, a real challenge for them. You know, as part of this, I've asked my students to go in and read research journal articles. And while they're very technical, uh, I think that it, it pushes them to see the application and uh, to, to stretch uh, what, they, what they know, what we've learned through genetics and um, the, uh, how certain genes when they turn on or off and phenotypes and genotypes and they're seeing those kinds of vocabulary come back in a very authentic way and how it's applying to science in a bigger picture rather than just here in one section in a textbook, so. True. That's a great well, everybody, I have to go to another call for another teacher. Okay.
Hey, Thank Josh. You for me. Josh. Yeah, thanks hey, for coming by. Great. Feel free to pop in next you. week. Yeah. Um, Miss Waters. All right. For our, thanks, Josh. Do we have? To, are we? Is it mandatory for us to leave this call for our English call? Uh, if you need to go to English, yes, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I can't impede on Miss. Or, or you can stay. <laughs> oh, I was about to say because I because I talked to Miss our English teacher and she said that it was fine for us to miss her call. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you've already gotten permission to do that, then you can stay on. So it, that's fine. You don't have to, to leave. It's only those that I know had definitely had to go over there to check in with her on, on something and had a question to ask. So uh, we're, our school's done a good job in trying to schedule the subject areas throughout the day uh, for students to interact with all of their teachers. And so um, we're trying not to step on each other's toes too much for that. Kayla, but, uh, we, we can write a collective note. <laughs> we can write a collective <laughs> note for Kayla if necessary, right? That's right, yes. Oh, no, yeah, I didn't mind the teacher would be fine. <laughs> yeah, I could put my note in the chat. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> write her in a piece awesome. everyone. There you yeah. are. Kayla's hey, Trent, well, well, while we've got you here, um, the, so say hello to everybody and give us an introduction about what you're doing on Veggie because that, when ExoLab grows up, it wants to be veggie, basically, right? So, you uh, know, the tail I, I'm telling the dog, you what, uh, getting, yeah. getting excited. I am uh, really so excited to hear what everyone's doing. And I sent Ted a note, and uh, I think Michael, we are testing legumes right now in the space station building. And uh, it's uh, actually, we were going to be testing them next year, but we accelerated them because one of the astronauts is curious and wants to grow legumes. And uh, it was so great to see Box on too, Greg Johnson. I used to, you know, I, used, I knew him when he was an astronaut. I knew him when he was in, in cases and it was just great to see him just now. And, and so, you know, you all are studying legumes and why we are studying legumes is because legumes are high in B1. And B1 is one of those nutrients that does not keep well uh, in the packaged diet. And so we are, uh, we wanna study uh, the uh, plants uh, for B1, uh, but the things that we look for plants, when uh, the student said, you know, 12 to 18 inches, that's not too tall. That's, that, that's about the limit, but that's not too tall. And there are ways to stunt plants. There are ways you can confine the root uh, volume. You can actually uh, rub a plant and stunt it. That's why uh, trees around windy areas are stumpy because they get that uh, feedback from the wind and they stay small. So that's what happened. My uh, dad rubbed my head too much when I was little. Is that what happened? That's my <laughs> issue too. I'm five foot seven. I blame my dad and my mom. Uh, but you know, so there's there's ways to uh, kind of uh, dwarf plants. But for us, you know, we look for plants that are, that are going to uh, germinate quickly. If you have a slow germinator, oh, I see someone uh, over there. Oh man, yeah, look at that. we got a little uh, pest in our in our uh, legume root here. Crawling yeah, you gotta you gotta. You got a passenger. Yeah, uh, I have idea. So I have idea from Germany. Yeah. We have to find our plants, and we uh, alfalfa plant and other plants uh, have very much proteins, and we have to see if the extract of proteins uh, is inhibitor for the pro uh, protein kinase from COVID nineteen, and so we have to see if it is inhibitor. We know uh, we know the COVID nineteen the polymerase. Uh, makes this sickness. And so we have to see if the proteins uh, is inhibitors extract of the proteins is a uh, inhibitor of the polymerase. I have to see, uh, we have to see uh, for all our plants uh, for the proteins. A crazy idea, but well, it is idea. <laughs> well, for, for us, we are targeting vitamin K, vitamin C and B1 for Mars, essentially. And uh, so we are uh, learning to grow plants in veggie on space station. I have an experiment in progress now, which is why I was late uh, coming in. I have uh, on orbit ops tomorrow morning, but we are learning how to grow and eat plants. These are uh, fresh uh, pick and eat plants. So, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, like soybean, you would have to process the soybean. So that's maybe a longer you know, duration when you have more of an established colony. Uh, so some of the uh, plants that we're looking at, we have fresh pick and eat, then we have intermediate plants like potato and sweet potato that maybe you got to cook. We don't have a way to cook on space station, not even a microwave. Uh, so that's an intermediate plant. And then we look at dwarf wheat and soybean and other types of plants uh, like that for a uh, longer duration stage. But I really like legumes uh, like peas, 
uh, uh, crimson, uh, like the Clover uh, team, I was really, I was just like, wow, Clover. We, I got Clover uh, growing in a veggie unit right now. So, you know, I have petite, what do we got? Petite snap peas that we just planted. I have a tendril pea plant that we just planted. So we are testing peas. So this is really great timing uh, for me personally, because I'm like, man, I got plants up in the space station building in veggie units right now. So I am really, really looking forward to learn what you all uh, find and in, uh, in the experiments that you run. And for Lori, I got a question for you. When you're using the Mar uh, Martian simulant, which simulant are you using? Because the chemistry of the simulant is really important. A lot of the simulants are uh, mechanical simulants or they're from a desert or they're from a mountain. And that's not the right chemistry and mineralogy. And there's only one uh, organization that I know of that's tried to get the mineralogy right, which means the chemistry is going to be close. And that's uh, Exolift Labs in Central Florida. Oh, okay. Um, this is one that I had ordered. Um, I had done a, did a little bit of searching. Um, it was from a site called the Martian Garden. And um, it had a bit of a, it's out of Texas. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Um, yeah, yeah, they get they get theirs from California. Yeah, I think it's and a they get it they get it for, template, so it's not perfect. Right. Yeah. So that's that's a desert uh, simulant. So it's missing some of the minerals that you would have. So, you know, okay. uh, from the uh, landers and from the rovers, uh, you know, we've pieced together kind of what a global recipe would be like. Yeah, there you go. And and it's not and it's not right. By the way, any simulant you get is going to be wrong. Right. Okay. Because it's, it's going to be different depending on where you land, just like on Earth, right? You land in Florida, the soil is going to be different. You land in Illinois or in, in, in Japan, it's going to be different. But where we've landed, we've pieced together kind of the common components, and, and, and we got the mineralogy uh, pretty close. And so there is some carbonate. There is some sulfate. Uh, certainly, perchlorate is a pretty pervasive uh, uh, item that we need to deal with in plants. Some plants are negatively impacted by perchlorate. They just, they'll be sick or they won't grow. Other plants are fine with it. They don't care. But all the perchlorate goes in the plant. And if you're eating the plant, you're eating perchlorate. And so the perchlorate absolutely has to be dealt with. And so perchlorate remediation is going to be really important in using uh, the simulant. The other issue with the simulant is a lot of it's very fine, but not all of it. So, you know, just like on Earth, you're going to have dust and then you have rocks. And so... I, I kind of look at it like, you know, a lot of people tell me, so, well, that's not what the simulant is. And I'm like, well, I see rocks on Mars. So don't, don't tell me that there's not different uh, compositions. Maybe we can sift and get the right uh, particle sizes, right? Because if you get the, the really fine stuff and you try, try to grow plants in it, well, that stuff becomes like concrete, right? And you're not going to grow anything in it. And, 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 but you, I think you all are on the right track trying to figure out how can we convert this uh, you know, this basically broken rock is essentially what it is. How can we convert broken rock into soil? And I think that's a good track and understanding all the different stuff that it takes to do that is really important. And it's, you know, it's actually a, a field of science. So that's awesome. Well, yeah, that's Trent, I, I'm so Talk glad you Alan. spoke to that. That is exactly what our goal for this program is, is we want teachers and students engaged in authentic scientific research. Um, and you know, as you well know, you don't know where it's going to take you. And nine times out of 10 or 9.9 .9 times out of 10, you get something completely beyond what you ever hypothesize. But you always learn something. Um, you know, I think it's very exciting. Could you speak to two, two pieces that you mentioned? One, why is vitamin K so important? Because we've got the K-Pro diet that, that, that's been developed for microgravity. And what is the problem with perchlorates in terms of human consumption? Okay. Sure. Uh, so uh, perchlorate is, I think it, I have to go look it up and see, but it basically I think it causes cancer. It's, it's, it's not healthy, right? It'll kill you if you eat well, too good, much of it, right? Of our diet. So yeah, so dealing with perchlorate, it's going to be overall a challenge, right? Because the perchlorate dust is going to get in. What are you going to do about it? So dust mitigation, keeping things clean, uh, you know, air filtration, all that's going to be a challenge for the settlers on Mars. Uh, but, you know, being, you know, uh, you know, the veggie project manager and, and working with the plant scientists, they're like, oh, my God, what are we going to do about the plants and eating the plants? And so, 
you know, you got to remediate it. You can use microbes to remediate it. You can bake it out, right? All, all the perchlorates that I'm aware of, the uh, calcium and uh, what's the other perchlorate species? Anyway, the other per perchlorate, uh, magnesium perchlorate, I think it is, you know, they'll bake out at four or 500 degrees Celsius. So if you're processing the regolith uh, to get water and you're doing it at a high temperature, well, you're going to be baking out perchlorates too. So maybe you can use that slag, that leftover material, as a constituent for your soil. You know, there's all different ideas that I have. And, you know, NASA's taking a look at uh, in situ resource utilization. How can we do these things? How can we build our habitats out of that? And then, you know, I'm like, well, what do you got left over over there? Maybe we'll take some of that. So, you know, this idea about being sustainable is so important for being on the moon and Mars. And, and you all are, uh, are testing all that. Vitamin K in the package diet, along with vitamin C and B1, degrade over time. So if you're going to send ahead your package diet, because you're not going to send astronauts unless you know you've got food there and other things that they need. So you're going to send it ahead, make sure it lands where you want it, make sure it's all in good condition, then you're going to send your crew. Well, that package diet is just sitting there. And uh, vitamins and uh, you know flavor compounds, over time, they change. Just through kinetics and thermodynamics, they change. And so the things that you send change over time. And so the palatability of the food changes over five years, you know, the flavor and the, and the smells and the uh, vitamin content changes. And so this is, you know, you're going to go there, you're going to do your mission. And then when you need the vitamins the most, when you're coming home, you're not going to have them. And so this is really the key component of, you know, using synthetic biology and plant biology to, you know, plants are molecular architects. When they're growing and doing their thing, they're making this stuff as a byproduct. They're just molecular architects. And so if we can grow plants and eat them for food and for uh, psychosocial benefits and morale, as uh, Box alluded to, and, and the diet, man, what a big deal. And, you know, dude, you are so far from home. You could barely see the earth. You're, you're going away from, the, from home, and that blue marble is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And there's no sunrise or sunset until you get to Mars. And that plant is kind of like your uh, touchstone of home. And so that's going to be, I think, really an important part of growing plants is not only for food and nutrition, but just as that touchstone of home. So, you know, that, that's the, really the answer on vitamin K, uh, vitamin C, and B1 is it just degrades over time. But I think plants uh, would, will provide a lot more than that. And th those are critical for, for muscle and bone density maintenance, correct? Yeah, I mean, just the health and human performance in general, right? You have to have the nutrition and the food so you can perform. And, you know, when you get to Mars, you're going to have a transition period. And then when you leave Mars, you're going to have some transition period. And when you're coming home, when you really got to be uh, up on your game, you don't want to be sick or nutritionally challenged. No. I wish Box were still on. He tells this hilarious story of when he came back from his first flight. Um, and of course his wife and his daughter come up to greet him and he's holding his daughter and he's got, somebody gives him a can of soda and he's, you know, sipping his soda, first carbonated beverage he's had in two weeks or whatever. The NASA administrator comes up to shake his hand. So what does he do? I'm not going to drop my daughter, drops the soda because in microgravity, it's just going to kind of hang out there. Well, I know that story well. Yeah, I said, I said it right there because it always stayed there before. Didn't stay there that time. Got them all. Splash them with Diet Coke. <laughs> well, the administrator, the administrator got a, a, a soda bath. <laughs> you know, our discussion about the uh, regolith there on Mars is kind of lead into the top of the hour here when Dr. Ellen Stefan will join us. I don't I think she's on right now, but uh, we'll be able to ask more specific questions about those perchlorates and what have you and what we might be able to do to remediate that soil so it does become healthy for uh, plant development. That's exciting. I'm very naive about all these things and really happy that everyone can join us. So, um, so Ted, I'm gonna to introduce uh, my wife, Lauren, just Lauren Tucker just joined us. Um, she's uh, a, 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 a trauma therapist. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of the social emotional stuff, I think she could talk about, you know, the criticality of that and this little experiment in isolation that we're, we're going through right now. Um, but also she's a solar system ambassador. So she's got, got a couple of things about planetary science that she could talk about too. Well, there you go. Actually, just a, a nod to uh, the state of the world right now. I think it's pretty important. Uh, we're trying to stay as upbeat as we can. Uh, it's very easy to focus on uh, the dramatic 
uh, and whatever thing that is you're counting to get you even more nervous. What we're trying to do here with the Magnitude Live sessions is to focus on things that we can actually change, things we can uh, improve on, and not things that we can't change. When we look at those numbers and those counts, we know what we can do. And what someone shared with me, when in the world did you ever think that sitting on the couch watching TV would save the world? All right? but that's all we need to do. You just pretty much sit on the couch, watch. Well, we're doing more than that, right? We're doing some experiments, whatever. We're hanging out in a global conversation. Uh, but I think that's how you deal with it right now. Uh, but let's focus our attention on maybe things we can change our future if we do the right planning. And whether it's thinking about growing something on a different world uh, or on our, on our moon, we can even be thinking about our plants and, and what that means for us here on Earth. How are we going to feed all these people? Uh, with the changing climate, uh, will they be able to take more salt in, like what you're doing, Glory, with your class? Will they be uh, more tolerant to heat, uh, et cetera? Will they produce more with less uh, nutrients? Um, but uh, maybe speak a little bit to some of the emotional challenges. I think we all need to accept that all of us are kind of approaching this in a different way. Um, so, Lauren, since you are, are here with us, you know, maybe just talk a little bit about that. The role of plants, why it's important, and like just the mental state and true. Um, well, just to start from the very micro, um, because schools have had to close down and, um, um, you know, for example, Michael's school, um, he had to gather up all his plants and all his projects to bring them home. So now we have all these experiments kind of all over the house, which is actually kind of fun. I was like, What's every whole place is going to turn to a lab, but um, instead, it's been really interesting in terms of having um, the plants um, in the living room um, against you know the windows and in the kitchen. Um, so uh, for one is a kind of a visual aspect. You have this other growth of life um, that. Um, has been really important um, during this time of, you know, you hear of, you know, trauma and death and so on and so forth. Um, um, and the other piece of that is, so that really is uplifting to the spirit. Um, the other piece of that is um, the actual um, sense of life and nutrients and so on and so forth. And um, in the place where you're traveling in space, where you're not necessarily connected to your loved ones, the people that you see all the time, your usual routines um, for the astronauts, for people who will be working with astronauts on the gateway um, experiment to the moon and on to Mars and um, so on and so forth, that that gives a, a very much of connection um, to life, to nutrients, to taking in healthy things, um, to be sustainable, to be, um, um, to, you know, feel like you have some input into what you're doing as opposed to things just happening to you. Um, so, you know, that's important in terms of space. I think it's important in terms of the earth, um, you know, and climate change and in, in having that. It seems like present. there's something really therapeutic about gardening yes. too. I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. Is a Zen thing or meditative? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's true in space too. The astronauts. Uh, I get. Uh, we debrief the crew every time they return. Uh, I talk to them uh, whenever they're at Kennedy. And what you're saying, I think it's universal and extends to space. So well said. Right. Right. Uh, hey, so, I see uh, Ellen Michael, has joined us. Dr. Yeah, Ellen Stofan. Yeah, Hello. Go. Exogeologist. Yes. So how did you become a geologist, Ellen? And how does how does one become an exogeologist? So um, I always say my I have the worst story because you know my dad worked for. NASA. I think it's a great story. <laughs> it's I asked you. The worst story. Well, to me, it's just a difficult story because you know when you're when you're talking about how to inspire kids, which is obviously what I do now full time at the Air and Space Museum. Um, you know, it's hard for me to understand how in the world do other people get into this field when I just grew up around it. And so it was just something that always was, though my sister's an attorney, so this didn't affect her at all. But <laughs> I, I mean, you know, to me, I was just one of those kids who always picked up rocks, loved gardening, loved being outside, loved wandering around. And it, when I was about 11 or 12, I figured out there was such a thing as geology. Um, and that you could get paid for picking up rocks. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good gig. 
Um, but then when I was 14, I was at the launch of the two Viking landers to Mars because my dad was in charge of the launch vehicle that was launching them. Uh, and Carl Sagan and the other scientists from Viking were giving talks on why we were going to Mars and looking for life on Mars and studying the geology of Mars to help us understand Earth. And I thought, wow, uh, that's what I want to do. I didn't realize there was such a thing. I thought everybody that worked for my for NASA also looked like my dad, you know, and I didn't think people who look like me work for NASA. Cool. Um, so well, I'm we glad invited, you proved that wrong. And <laughs> <laughs> we invited Ellen to come and talk to us about the the geology of Mars and and thinking about this. But Trent was talking about the issues of of perchlorates and we yeah. were talking about the the uh salt levels um with Lori's students um they they were doing some experiments with uh legumes and um uh salt uh e exposure um where they were trying to titrate out just where the the lethal dose was and what they could tolerate um so that you know students also this is a great opportunity to ask some some really cool scientists some some tough questions put them on the spot <laughs> So do you, what do you think? Is it possible that we could garden Mars? You know, yes, obviously, you know, definitely yes. The question though is how do you deal with things like maybe some areas have really high levels of salts, high levels of perchlorates. Per Luckily perchlorates dissolve in water. So, um, and we know there's a lot of water on Mars. So if you, well, there's ice and under the surface, there's likely water. So if you wash the soil, um, you should be able to use it maybe with some additives because obviously for kids who don't understand soil is not just little bits of ground up rock the way the soil is on Mars there's organic matter there's things that change the density of it. Um, and so you have to think do I have to add something to that soil, but when you consider really successful gardens or greenhouses here on earth tend to use raised beds they tend to use. Um, soils that they amend, either it's too much clay here on the earth or it's too much sand. And so we'd have to do the same thing on Mars. We'd just have to do a little extra work and then it would be fine because basalt is actually one of the main rocks here on earth. It's the main rock on Mars. It has things like iron, magnesium, um, that, that plants like nutrients. Um, and that's a lot of what basalt is. There's all kinds of nutrients that ground up basalt gives to plants that we need here on earth and we would need on Mars. Interesting. We've got this beautiful uh, basalt formation here where I live called the Palisades. And uh, it's just these perfect hexagonal columns um, just because of the really slow cooling um, that that magma, magma did. I think there's yeah, only think other about, formations like it in the world. Yeah, think of a place like Hawaii, um, which the Hawaiian Islands are basalt. <laughs> you know, they're they're basically that's what they are. There's really nothing else there except for organic matter that gets as the basalt weathers. So as it gets broken down by rain and erosion, you form a basalt dominated soil. Now, of course, the soil in Hawaii then gets mixed with organic matter. But Hawaii is a great place, right, for plants. I mean, huge amounts of plants grow there. People, you know, grow pineapples, all kinds of fruit there. So you really have to look at what kind of soil do you have on Mars? The basics of it are fine. What are the parts we don't like so much, like the perchlorate? Again, luckily, perchlorate's a little bit easy to get rid of. The salts are think something I all again dissolvable in water, but how do you wash soil on Mars in a way? But you know, it's um you know, people are always, when I was working at, at NASA and working on um, human architectures to go to Mars, you know, the, the challenges we face with trying to have something like setting up a settlement on Mars to me are so much less than the challenges we faced when we were getting ready to send humans on the moon to the moon, when we didn't know how to calculate rocket trajectories. You know, we didn't know, we'd never done life support before. We had never, you know, we didn't really understand the effects of microgravity on the human body. We're so far ahead of that in getting ready to have humans go to Mars in a, in a way that's productive and sustainable. So what do you, do you so our, our working hypothesis is we could, if we can get these legumes and, and rhizobia to, to do their thing in microgravity, 
uh, and the harsh conditions of the space station, elevated carbon dioxide, elevated temperatures. And some of the students were, were actually looking at the opposite extreme, cold temperatures, which is great because that's something we got to deal with with Mars. Yeah, what's your opinion? Uh, you want to weigh in on whether that could be a start to a, the, the organic amendments that, that we would need in the, so in the regolith? I, I think so. And I, I think it's also changing the whole mindset almost of how you think about plants and what you're growing and how you're growing it. And I, I know when we talk about genetic modification of, of crops here on the earth, it makes people really nervous. Um, but when you think of it, all plants have gone through genetic modification. It's called evolution. And so now like you're trying breeding. To, yeah, now we're trying to grow plants in microgravity. And I really like for kids to think about an experiment. If you think about a, 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 a wheat, how much of that wheat plant is structurally the way it is? Because it has to fight against gravity every day of its life. It has to fight against rain and wind and everything else. It's putting all this energy of plantedness into things that you don't need in space. There's no wind, um, there's no gravity. Um, so what would a plant be, a wheat, a, a, a rhizome, a legume, what would it need without gravity? And it needs a lot less and it needs some different things. So then you go to Mars and you say, okay, one third gravity, slightly different soil, um, no wind, a little bit of wind, but again, you know, making sure we all discount the Martian, even though there's wind. <laughs> yeah, the that, air, that atmospheric density has got a little bit of a... <laughs> The atmosphere density is very low. So a plant doesn't have to have all this structure to fight against wind. It doesn't need it anymore. And so, and so that's what I really love about using the space station as an opportunity to say, how can we start moving down? Because I can't wait 20 million years to evolve a Mars plant or a space plant that we're gonna need on the way to Mars. How do I, how do I think about the characteristics of a plant and what might need to be genetically modified? And then how do I need to grow it differently? But how do I put all that efficiency, all that energy into producing food for humans? Um, so don't waste time with, and energy with all this other stuff. Put all that into rapid production of seed or fruit or whatever it is that we want to eat. Cool. Um, you were talking about basalt a few minutes ago and um, I know a lot of our students and teachers are would, would really like to try to simulate the Mars regolith. So, so definitely, it sounds like we would want to have basalt as one of our constituents. What what else would we want to add? Um, you know, basalt is really <laughs> pretty much it on Mars. But one of the things to think about is, um, I, I don't know if folks have uh, the students have really looked at all at pictures of Gale Crater that the Curiosity rover has been taking. So while I talk all the time about basalt, which obviously, as we talked about with Hawaii, comes from lava flows, it's produced in volcanoes, that is the dominant rock on Mars. But if you look in Gale Crater, it's um, what has made us all so excited about Gale Crater is that we're seeing rocks called conglomerates. We're seeing what appear to be mudstones or siltstones. All right, what are those made of? All right, it's still the, stuff of basalt, but just like I talked about in Hawaii, those basalts have gotten weathered. Um, that's good because that means there's been a little bit of a chemical alteration, which brings out some of those things like magnesium and iron that, that plants need. And, and then that crumbled up basalt or eroded basalt has now been reformed into new rocks, conglomerates, these sedimentary rocks. Um, Basalts are what we call igneous rocks that are produced by melting within the earth. Sedimentary rocks are produced by water erosion flowing and then recompaction, re um, re what we call relithification or Ooh, remaking re it a rock again. I like that um, word. <laughs> it's a great word. Um, <laughs> geologists like really complicated words. Um, so do biologists. <laughs> yeah, so, so all these rocks we're seeing in, in Gale Crater Ultimately, they're still made of those, those things that make up basalt, magnesium, iron, um, a little bit of magnesium, titanium, molybdenum, hopefully a little bit of nickel. These things that actually um, plants all need, those are again called nutrients, but they're also elements that make up rocks and make up basalt. They've just been reformulated, but that's good because if you go out and you think about sticking a 
trowel in the ground and you pull up a trowel full of soil, it, it's all mixed together so particle sizes. That makes the soil be a little bit airy and fluffy and plants like that. They don't tend to that like- speaks highly, to your point, Trent. Yeah, they don't like highly compacted soil. So again, I think that's gonna be the challenge as we go to Mars is what do we find when we get there? Are we gonna find clays? There are clays on Mars, so really compacted fine sediments. Other places, it'll be more like um, um, gravelly almost. So what we're gonna need to do is get a little bit of this, a little bit of that, mix it together, maybe add some stuff. I know with some experiments that have done in the past, they've added coffee grounds. So how do we mix in some other things like what people like to call amendments and how do we change the soil to make it, to get it to the point where we need it to be. If I could mention something that I've done with one of my uh, somewhat Martian simulants is to add the, the perlite to it. Um, and since that's made of volcanic glass, it's possible that you might be able to find that in situ on Mars. Um, I don't know if there's been any specific discoveries, but it's, it's just basically different silicons that you mix in. And we add that all the time to our soil here to help retain that moisture and add to that fluffiness uh, effect. Because it definitely makes a difference so that the, the clay doesn't uh, compact and uh, lock in those uh, roots and crush the roots. Yeah, and I, I think it's a real difference for, for people who don't know if you, if you think about um, there is going to be an awful lot of fine grained material on, on Mars. And I don't know if you guys talked about that before I came on, but dust no, on no. Mars is a real issue because we, we know there's a lot of dust on Mars. It gets blown all around. It forms ripples. It forms dunes. And some of it is quite fine grained. And yeah, you add water to really fine grained dust and you're going to get sludge. I mean, it's going to be <laughs> nasty. It's, a plant is going to say, what the heck? I'm not going to grow in that. And so that idea of, of what can we mix in that we can find on Mars or that we bring with us is going to be important. And there should be volcanic glass. That should not be a problem. Uh, the, another uh, student experiment I had for one of our science fair projects is they, they did a composting bin. Uh, and so this idea of taking some of the um, different types of worms uh, perhaps with us to Mars to uh, also add to that natural process of decomposition. Uh, have you uh, encountered that any uh, in your kind of exploration of Martian gardens and in, in, uh, bringing some, some worms along? I haven't, but I love that idea. And you know, we, they actually do experiments with worms up on the ISS. So um, we know that worms can survive in zero gravity. So they can they can make it on the trip there. But I think that's a great idea because composting is obviously, you know, it, it's what I really love in thinking about this is we like to really think about the earth is how do we make the earth more sustainable? And the things we're really thinking about and challenge us to make the earth sustainable with climate change like composting, like not wasting food, like really saying, how do I reuse and repurpose everything I have? To me, Mars is the same thing. It's just kind of on steroids, right? And so every scrap of food waste on Mars should then be composted into the garden to make the gardens. And so then the, the longer you have a settlement and people producing that kind of thing, the better the gardens are gonna get because uh, humans generate a lot of waste. So, you know, Ellen, that's a great point. An international space station is not a closed system, right? Uh, it requires water to come up from, uh, from Earth. Uh, we have a garbage scow that gets filled up and set down to burn up in the atmosphere every so often. And so we're going to have to really rethink what we're doing uh, from LEO uh, to the, the, maybe the gateway to the surface of Mars. I think so, and that's why I've always been a big fan of the Gateway because um, it, it's really hard to step away from Earth's dependency with the ISS. It's um, it's habit. It's um, you can do it, so why don't you? Um, it's expensive to make some of those changes, so you you don't want to make them. But as you move to the Gateway, you have to start making those. You have to be less Earth dependent, and then you have to move to Earth. Um, independent really in going to Mars. Obviously we're never gonna be completely independent. I've been watching the expanse. So now talking about this is hurting my head. <laughs> the way it's like sending the kids off to college, eventually they gotta be on their own, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And so then you really start thinking, all right, what are the things I can start stepping away from? And water, obviously now we're at the point where we're re recycling, 
you know, high 80% of the water on the ISS, but we think for a voyage to Mars, you need to probably be recycling 92, 93% of the, of the water. We're going to learn, we're trying to learn how to do that on the ISS, but we've got to do it at Gateway. And so to me, Gateway is this push to get you to that next level of Earth independence that we're having a hard, we're, we're doing on the ISS, but we're not quite getting as far as we need to to get to Mars. It's interesting about the psychology around it in terms of the Gateway project. Um, hi, Ellen, it's Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's really interesting in terms of psychology around, you know, the whole Gateway project because, you know, developing all the technology that we would have to get to the moon and then have the, uh, the different pieces on the moon, you know, to then go further. And, you know, that separation of, you know, Ted used the example of the people going to college. Well, I think of it as like the ISS because you can still like convey, you know, things that they need to, for college, them to come home. You know? <laughs> right. And they can, you know, they come back, they can come back relatively easily, you know, when they want. Like, you know, yeah, I got need... one of them upstairs right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have three of them upstairs. <laughs> so it's interesting that that to get past the psychology of it to then build the technology for it. Um, you know, I think I find that fascinating. I can't even yeah. imagine what it would, what it's gonna be like to be on the surface of Mars and Earth is just a tiny dot in the sky the way Mars is a tiny dot in the sky from here. That just- huh. Yeah, it's really hard. And I, I think for, you know, people who are really used to this Houston, we have a problem mentality. Mm -hmm. To say, you say Houston, we have a problem and 45 minutes later you hear what? You know, so, so you have no choice but to get out of that mentality. You have to say, how do you truly become Earth independent? How do you, how do you go, go to artificial intelligence, for example, to help you solve problems because Houston's not there anymore or by the time they're there, they're no longer really relevant. So how do you, how do you need, how are you gonna need to rely on, on um, artificial intelligence? And then to me, it's really going back to this, um, you know, again, I always come back to climate and the earth. And, you know, we had this paradigm of reduce, reuse, recycle, which was supposed to be a hierarchy. It wasn't supposed to be an equivalency. Um, and yet they put it in a triangle. So it makes it look like all three are the same, but really we're supposed to reduce and then reuse. And it absolutely last, you know, resort, you recycle. And so when you go to Mars, you have to do that, right? You're gonna to have to repurpose everything as much as you can, hence the compost. And to be gross, your pee and everything else, you've got to use, reuse everything. And then frankly, you have to do with less, right? How are you gonna make do with less stuff, less whatever? Um, and, and then you've got to recycle anything you have, whether it's your clothes into new 3D printed clothes or however you do it, but. It's yeah, I think this is the perfect analog to that, that for our students and, and teachers, you know, we got to be creative problem solvers, we got to be team workers, we've got to, you know, have some independence. Um, and, you know, so here's the perfect chance to, I keep saying this, you, you want to engineer something, go raid your toy box and repurpose old toys that you don't play with anymore. There's a, there's a gold mine there of, of stuff. There you go. You right, know, and uh, you mentioned reusing things. There was just a, a study done I read about yesterday on with 3D printing and looking at uh, structures for the moon um, of using the urea from the um, human urine. I saw that. Right, to combine, and they're measuring, you know, what can it take the load like a concrete does. And so it, it is thinking about how to reuse everything, uh, even down to uh, things, you know, like containers, breaking it back down and using that as filament in, in 3D printers. And this is, a, I think, a huge skill that we're missing in a lot of our schools, too, is uh, integrating that kind of technology into every single class. It's not just uh, one type of uh, uh, you know, technology class you take during a day, but you get to do the, that 3D printing and design perhaps in every class and make it more uh, cross-curricular because all of these problems are so integrated and the solutions, it won't be solved from just one discipline. It's going to definitely be interdisciplinary. Exactly right. I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, 
Dr. Stefan, I, I know that you're also fascinated about other heavenly bodies as well. You've done work with Venus, much different atmospheric pressure there, but also you have a fascination with a moon, Titan. Uh, and so for our younger viewers, listeners, uh, you know, the future is going to go beyond exploring just Mars, right? As we look at probes to send uh, uh, other uh, moons and other planets. Can you share any other thoughts you have about our immediate uh, um, solar system, our little community here of planets around our sun? Uh, sure, we well, about, you uh, know, sure. To me, you know, the whole reason we go out and explore the planets is ultimately to try to understand the one we have right here that we live on better. Um, because to truly understand the Earth, it really helps to be able to compare it to other planets. Um, and I always tell kids, you, you, don't, you don't understand how lucky you were because uh, you are because, you know, when I was in school and when I was their age, we had nine planets. And then, of course, we went to eight when we got rid of poor Pluto. Um, but kids today are going to have thousands and thousands of planets to study because we've discovered so many planets around other stars. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, because to understand how a planet works, it really helps to have something to compare it to. So when we go to Venus, we're really, I studied volcanoes on Venus. So we're trying to say, how do volcanoes work? And if I can compare volcanoes on the earth to ones on Mars, to ones on Venus, I'm really gonna understand volcanoes better. And here on the earth, we have people who live right next to volcanoes, whether you're in Seattle, Washington, or, or in Naples, Italy, you have a volcano right in your backyard. And so you need to know when that volcano is gonna erupt and what kind of eruption it's gonna be. And so by studying other planets, we actually understand our own better. I never thought that a little moon out in the end of the solar system would steal my heart, but <laughs> I, I worked on the Cassini mission to um, Saturn. And we were mostly using a radar instrument. Radar is important because it can see through the clouds to see a surface. And so this moon of Saturn called Titan, it's actually um, about the size of our, it's not that different in size from our own moon, but it's the only moon in the solar system that has a substantial atmosphere. Its atmosphere is mostly nitrogen like ours. Um, but oddly enough, even though this moon is all the way out at Saturn, so over a hundred million miles away from the earth, it rains. Uh, the rain goes down and forms rivers and lakes. It evaporates back. So you have a whole cycle, just like our water cycle here on the earth. But out at Saturn, it's incredibly cold. So that fluid isn't water. It's actually liquid methane and ethane, which are basically what make up gasoline. Um, so you have all the processes like water, but the fluid is different. And so Titan's the only other body in the solar system where you have open rivers flowing down into a sea, you've got waves, you've got all the things we have only here on Earth. And so who would think you'd go all the way out to Saturn to be able to understand how does a body of liquid interact with an atmosphere and how can we use that to understand climate uh, better? And could there actually be life? The fluid isn't water, it's again, liquid gasoline. So. I'm working right now on a mission called Dragonfly, uh, and it's a really cool mission where we're going to send uh, a quadcopter. It's basically a drone that's going to fly around on Titan um, and look at the chemistry and try to understand how close did the chemical reactions on Titan proceed towards something that might look like life. So to, cool. can, can, can compare and contrast Dragonfly to, to your your previous uh, uh, suggestion of a, of, a, of a boat? So Michael and Lauren know I worked for years on a concept that was called time. It was the Titan Mare Explorer and Mare means sea in Latin. Uh, on, on the moon, the Mare are, are frozen basalt, um, but on Titan, as I said, the, the seas are actually liquid methane and ethane. So I had proposed to NASA to send a um, basically a, a floating probe, a boat, to go land on one of the seas on Titan, splash down, float across the sea, and see could there anything be living in that sea, and what are the characteristics, and how can we use that to understand better how oceans and atmospheres interact on the Earth. So it was a really cool mission. We made it pretty far through a NASA competition, and then we lost um, to the Mars uh, InSight mission, which is a really cool seismometer on Mars. Um, but I'm pr still pretty sad about my boat mission. It actually can't be done again till the late 2030s um, because it gets dark at the poles of Titan for a very long time during Titan winter. 
and the pole is where the big seas are. So you have to have a big enough sea that you can throw a spacecraft all the way from the earth and plop it right down in the middle of the sea. Um, so that mission can't happen until about 2040. Ah, it's really far yeah. from now. That is far away. We'll still be around for that. Modern medicine, right? Yeah. <laughs> As a sailor, I vote for that one. <laughs> Me too. Hey guys, I'm really sorry. I've got to run. I've got, uh, we're trying to figure out how do we run a museum yeah. Just like all you are trying to figure out how do we educate kids with no school? How do we run a museum with no museum? So. Well, they, we can do right. both of these, right? Yeah. Thank you so Ellen, much. Ellen, thank you us. so much. It's such a, such a generous oh, yeah. sharing of your time and intellect and personality, everything. We love you and thank you for everything yeah. that you're doing for us. Yeah, stay safe and healthy. You too. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Ellen. Uh, good no goodbye, Ellen. Good, big shout out from Joy Amasa to you. She couldn't make it, she wanted to say hi. Oh my God! Give her a give her a long distance hug from me. I'll, I'll give her I'll give her an elbow bump when I see her in the lab. Awesome. <laughs> see you later. Awesome. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Fantastic. Hey Ted, um, uh, Johan uh, from Germany. He has a question. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you're on mute there. Hold on. There we go. You're good, Johan. I saw a, a TV session with the ESA, the, the European Space Association, and they made some, um, some experiments in, in long tanks with the human waste and to, to give this to the plants. And I want to know if there are uh, experiments on the ISS to, with the human waste to extract something like... Um, Special things you can give to the plants that they can grow a little bit better. Is there any experiments there on the ISS? Uh, hey, this is Trent. I don't think there's any uh, specific experiments for that, but uh, Dr. Ray Wheeler, who I work with, uh, works with a lot of the water folks at Marshall Space Flight Center and Johnson Space Flight Center. And we, we we're trying to figure out how we could get some of the things out of the urine that would be helpful for plants, but they, the real issue is all the sodium. Uh, you know, we have a lot of salt in our urine. And so how do you, how do you get that salt out and keep the things in uh, that the plants need and get the salt out? So it's a, it's really kind of a trick on chemistry and ion exchange, but uh, you know, folks are looking at it and thinking about it. Uh, we just don't have any experiments in progress. Thank you. Sounds like an opportunity, Austin. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> That's definitely in the recycle and reuse model. <laughs> what a beautiful view, Liam. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, I, lo I, lo I love I love Don Pettit saying about the uh, water recycling on ISS, making today's coffee tomorrow's coffee. Salute. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Gil, you've been wanting to weigh in. Mm. Thanks for being patient. No problem. Sorry, I gotta I gotta run soon. But uh, Trent, good to see you again. I, I wanted to ask. Um, Specifically, we've been we ran some uh, studies here using the regolith from uh, Exa, uh, uh, Exolith, and we also made some simulants ourselves. And with both uh, both cycles, we had a lot of issues regarding cementing. Um, and the question that we got to was, how can we? Uh, what what biological questions or factors could we be looking into that could kind of support the reversal of this process because it's not we had it so much it became very very um uh, limiting so has there been anything uh regarding regolith uh development or the just the questions around cementing that we could be looking at yeah i uh i, I can tell you that uh, we have a intern at, at kennedy uh obviously her experiment's been halted in the recent uh, uh events but uh you know, that regular stimulant does uh, have some salts in it, some sulfates. If you look at the composition, you'll see uh, some of the salt. So, you know, I think the first thing that you'll see is probably the plants are going to get salt stressed. Even if you were to add a compost or something to kind of fluff it, I think you're still going to have salt. So, you know, you may consider doing a, a rinse or uh, something like that to rinse out the, uh, the carbonate and sulfate salts that I think are in that stimulant just like what uh, Ellen talked about with the perchlorates, right? You might bring in your regolith, give it a rinse, and then, and then 
and then evaporate the water out and, and you're left behind with this, uh, co this composition of salts that maybe you'll use, right? The perchlorate could be used for other purposes, maybe as a, as a rocket fuel, you know, perchlorates are, are pretty good oxidizers. So, um, so you might think about rinsing the, uh, as, a, as a test, doing a, doing a rinse, and then seeing what you can do with compost or other things that might be, you know, you gotta, I think I try to challenge students, think like a Martian, look around, think about what you're gonna have available to you. Are you gonna have a composter? You might. So, you know, on the way to Mars, maybe we'll have the astronauts growing some plants, uh, doing some plant experiments, and what are they gonna do with the in inedible plant waste? Well, hopefully they're going to throw it into a bioreactor or a composter. And so at the end, hopefully you'll have some organic matter that you can add to this uh, simulant. And to Ellen's point as well, and this is what I was trying to point out, is, you know, you have all these fines and all the regular has the fines because that is a major constituent. But when you look around, you see rocks. So I am certain that we can uh, probably sift or do something with the simulant that you get or you can even maybe center it, right, where you can get some of these finds and, and get them to agglomerate. Mm -hmm. So there, I think there are some methods that we can think about. Now, the, in, in the classroom, how do you do that? So maybe you just add some gravel, right, and so say, hey, we're going to add a mechanical simulant gravel. Um, but you can add compost and see how that does. Uh, you know, I think there's a few uh, really good scientific things that you can do as long as you document what you did uh, and you measure what you did you know, you're, you're going to have, you're going to get in different results because I bet you right now you're killing a lot of plants. <laughs> so Kayla, how are you at taking notes? Pretty good. You know, I actually opened up my Chromebook just to type down some stuff that I thought was interesting, especially to look up after this. Oh, there you go. I just thought that was cool. Like, especially when you were talking about like salinity and like heat tolerance, like and temperature tolerance, I thought that was something that I kind of looked up. I actually, like during this, I'm kind of looking at it, like looking at mung beans, they actually did have a really high salinity tolerance. And I was thinking like, um, would there ever be any way that like, you could like take legumes and like maybe help them build a tolerance to salinity, just like um, how, the, how the rhizobium can help mung beans build a tolerance to osmotic stress. Like, would there ever be a way that like a certain like rhizobium or other type of something like that would ever be able to help it build a, um, a tolerance to salinity, which would make it actually easier to grow in like different types of soil that might be on Mars. Uh, well, this is Trent. I'll, I'll say this is, is if you do a salt experiment, like a, you know, a university uh, professor salt experiment, a lot of times you'll do a number of different cultivars. You'll see which one does better. And then you can start breeding them, or you can figure out genetically what's different between them and identify the genes that maybe lends to salinity tolerance. And then if you know what those genes are, then through CRISPR-Cas and other means, you can maybe clip out things that uh, impact salt tolerance or add things in. Now, if you are just clipping and, and, and moving things around in the genome and not adding in it, then that's not transgenic, right? You're just doing genetic engineering. Now, you can add things in, but that's that, that's a little more complicated, but for the most part, I think you can use genetic engineering to get, you know, plants to shorten up, maybe to be more productive, uh, maybe to be more tolerant. Uh, and, and in my view on Mars, I, I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, that we'll be growing them outside due to the atmosphere, right? I think there's, uh, everything's going to be inside, maybe in a lava tube, in a, uh, you know, hopefully an enclosed garden, uh, maybe lit by electric light using LEDs. Uh, and, and where it's accessible to the crew, because I, I find uh, when I talk to the crew and we ask them, you know, do, you know, if you don't have veggie experiments, do you go check on the plants anyways? And a lot of times they're like, oh, yeah, we, we check on the plants. We talk about whose turn it is, the water and things like that. So uh, I think uh, if, if we are growing plants uh, for food, uh, the, having them near the near the astronauts is going to be important. And I think they're going to be inside. So, uh, you know, it's going to be 75 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, 22 degrees C. It's going to be 40 to 50 percent uh, relative humidity. And it's going to probably be a higher CO2 level. All the vehicles that I'm aware of typically have higher CO2 levels than we have on Earth, just because it's hard to scrub out all that CO2 down to 400 parts per million. So the plants will have to be tolerant to LED light, high CO2, 
uh, reduced gravity. Um, and, and, you know, when there's reduced gravity, plants, plants know something's different. And so they'll, sometimes they'll have a stress response. And because plants are plastic in their growth and they can't run away, they have all these, uh, plant scientists call them rings of defense. And so maybe the reduced gravity will trigger a defense response, even if that's, that's not an issue, right? It's, it may have a heat shock response, even though it's not under a heat shock stress, it's just uh, knows something's different. And that's, that's the only way it knows how to respond. Um, so, you know, having a plant that's robust, uh, that can grow in a lot of different environments, uh, I think will be important. And so I, I think of, you know, we got to grow robust plants that germinate uh, reliably and produce a lot of food and taste good. I can tell you, I talk to a lot of people, they say, oh man, algae, we're growing algae. And I'm like, that's awesome for feedstock. Are you growing algae in your garden to eat? And most of the time they tell me no. Uh, are you growing it in the garden? It's oftentimes on accident. So, you know, I, I tell them it's got to be palatable. You know, you, the astronauts are already under, under enough stress. They're in an uh, extreme environment. They've given up a lot, right? They're away from their families for a very long period of time. The, and, and they're probably going to lose uh, muscle mass, even with the pretty good food they get. Box, you know, Box talked about the food's not the greatest. But, you know, no one goes to space for the food. <laughs> and the food that gets pretty good. So, you know, the least we could do is try to make sure the food's going to taste okay. And, you know, uh, it, it, now sometimes you say, well, it's survival. All right, well, great, it's survival. You could still, I think, find plants that taste good, provide the nutrients they need, and be robust. And legumes are one of our top candidates for B1. So you all are on the right track. So, so Kayla, I think, you know, you've got all kinds of time on your hands right now. I, I think you need to start running some of those trials and see what kind of hybrids you can come up with. And we got, we actually have a couple of scientists here in the background that could maybe give you a little bit of a, a leg up on setting that up. That's so exciting. Another big reason that, I'm oh, sorry. Kayla, this question, we could um also talked to dr barker with the gilroy lab because he's looked yeah. a lot about um into the genetics and um you know particular genes that are turning on and off uh you know focused on those stressors like with salinity so uh, maybe in his database he yeah there's a he's got a huge database he was going to try to be onto this chat but he, yeah, apparently something got whatever um so we've got access to this amazing database of genetic information um, that you can actually build from. There's, there's, I mean, you, you, you've got a lifetime of research you could, could, could dive into there, Kayla. <laughs> you were just about to ask a question, Kayla. <laughs> It wasn't really a question. It was like more, it was more of like some of the reasons that I was choosing mung beans, like while we were just talking about it, it had like a lot of like nutritional value, which was like one of the, um, cause like when looking at it, I was like, one of the biggest things that I was actually looking at was like, well, like what are the best, um, nu nutrients and like health sources that would be with this plant. And it was like, and looking at that, it was one of the, um, best plant-based sources of protein, which I would, which it actually help with. And that's very sustainable along like a long amount of time for this, which was actually really good for the mung beans as well. Yeah, I think for long-term uh, colonies, right? When And this is what I was talking about with the soybeans and the dwarf weed and the other beans. When we're, you know, when we're boots are planted and you're kind of got a permanent base, this is where you're going to really be looking to provide all of the food uh, through the, uh, di you know, through the garden, right? Through the farm. And so the farm is going to need to produce uh, calories. It's going to have to produce uh, all the essential aminos and all the vitamin and mineral content, including the micronutrients. And that's what uh, Ellen was uh, alluding to with the basalt, right? The nickel. We don't think of nickel as a nutrient because it's not. It's a micronutrient. If you get too much, you're not going to do well. But if you get, you know, just a micro dose, you're good. So uh, yeah, the farm down the road. You're going to be growing all these things and you're going to have the, you're going to have the equipment to cook it hopefully <laughs> and process it. So it's, it's going to be important. And so uh, the other piece of the puzzle is the farm. How will you grow these things? Right. Uh, you're going to hopefully have robots and we're going to have uh, AI and you're going to have sensors to tell you when the plants are doing poorly. Cause I can guarantee you things are not going to go well. 
So we're going to need to detect water stress and other types of stress that the plants may be under. Uh, we'll need a database to understand what does that stress look like and what do we need to do about it. And hopefully that database is an AI set of data that says, oh, it might be this. Human, go take a look and see what you think. So, uh, and all that is kind of under development right now uh, with my friend Ralph, who I uh, sit, sit next to. Well, actually, he's got an office down, down the hall, but I sit next to Dinah, who really runs the project. And, uh, you know, so, you know, space crop production, we're working on it. And, 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 and you all are uh, providing information and data and designing experiments that will help us do it. So I, I really look forward to seeing what you learn. You know, Trent, this is a really good point. Uh, it's kind of ad hoc as we're organizing this legume challenge, thinking about what's the right thing to send up. Uh, and if we look at it from your view as a researcher, what's the best way for us then, if we look and maybe follow the growing beyond earth model, right? With Fairchild, what you guys are doing there. Uh, and we systematize a, and create a standard for research. This and perhaps might be beneficial to researchers such as yourselves and others. Uh, and so oh, any yeah, guideline I, along I, that would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of volume, right? So we're talking about uh, seed storage, uh, bean and pea storage. How do you process them for flight? How do you keep them clean? How do you, are you going to sanitize them? Do you have to sanitize them? Uh, and then the work you're doing with the microecology, are, you, are they producing nodules? Are they, you know, what's the right bacteria? That all is incredibly helpful. So, and, and guess what? We're not doing that right now because we're focused on the more near-term ISS. How do you even grow a plant and eat it? There's not a way to wash your vegetables in space right now. The way that we sanitize the produce is painful. We don't have a salad spinner. We don't have a sink that you can go wash the vegetables in. You know, and, and people are like, well, you don't have a salad spinner. And I'm like, well, you know, it's not gonna work exactly the way you think it will. Um, so, you know, we're looking at plasma. We're, you know, we're trying to think about how can we cleanly do this? And, and I, th I think we got a nice, uh, kind of a uh, interim uh, solution where uh, we have this ProSan solution. You can foam it. I think if we put the ProSan solution in a Ziploc bag, the astronauts can just shake, shake it, bake it like they do with their salads and you would have sanitized produce. So, you know, but that, is that sustainable? Are you going to send the solution to Mars? Probably not. So, you know, but it gets a little easier to wash your vegetables on a planetary body because you do have some gravity. The water does flow down. Uh, the bubbles flow up. So, but, you know, how will you wash your vegetables on Mars and Moon is, is indeed a, a challenge. And so, um, you know, stay tuned for I, we, we need help. <laughs> how to wash your vegetables on Mars will be our next episode. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. And look who just joined us. I just thought him into being. <laughs> that's it, I was just thinking, uh, do, you, do you always need to wash your vegetables? Um, on Earth, yes, because of the, like, some of the chemicals, the pesticides and that that are used in the agro-ecosystem. But in a, in a virgin ecosystem, one being synthesized from scratch, you can imagine the, the engineering of a healthy microbiome that would mean you wouldn't need to wash uh, the vegetables. You could just sequence it, have a quick check that it's all okay. Nano pore in orbit works, so the gravity factor shouldn't be an issue. But then um, perhaps they could just eat natural organic produce instead of having to wash it. Just an alternative. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would love to get that through the NASA safety folks, uh, through the payload safety <laughs> review board and the flight docs. But, but no, uh, Richard, you, you're on the right track. I mean, if we had, uh, you know, uh, a camera that did, uh, uh, you know, kind of sensing for pathogens, or if we could just do a quick swab and, and sequence it within, you know, uh, you know probably a couple of minutes, the astronauts are hungry, they're not going to wait long. Uh, you know, I, I'm all for that. Um, you know, washing the vegetables on space station is, is uh, a precaution it's not a requirement but the safety folks make us do it because it's a precaution so you know just like it's a precaution at home because uh, when you are growing your plants in in a, uh, an environment where it is uh, you got humans and we're not sanitizing the humans you have the humans have all their uh, microbiome with them uh, there is potential to get a pathogen you know you know kind of even one set down in this nice warm environment now it grows from a one to a city and now you got a sick crew member, so um, yeah. yeah.
And that's one of the wonderful thing about the, the microbiome monitoring that's been ongoing on the, on the International Space Station. It's given us a, an opportunity to observe how the communities have changed in different places. And so that we can see that over time, certain uh, radiation tolerant uh, microorganisms that have been uh, described as being plant pathogens have started to accumulate on some of the locations that the astronauts uh, touch a lot, such as the, the dining room and the, uh, the dining room table and the advanced exercise resistance device like platform. So um, uh, real time monitoring of the ISS microbiome uh, provides a lot of opportunities for plant uh, agriculturists like yourself to ensure that you can adopt the right strategies to protect the crops. Um, so what happens and to in that of a catastrophe like what do you guys do if, if you do start to see pathogens going on crops? What's the, the protocol or plan? <laughs> Well, you know, if you get a pathogen on a crop, hopefully you're able to just, uh, you know, kill it with a wipe or kill it with a plasma or whatever, you know, the, the method might be, and then you can go eat it, right? Just like you might do a home. And, you know, what do you do to contain it? Well, you know, you, you have your filtration system, uh, your air filtration, you fil try to filter things out, HEPA filter, and you do your, you do your best. I mean, there's, I think you're going to end up with, you know, molds and fungus and, and the all the things that we have here, because again, we're not sanitizing the crew. Uh, actually, if I could chime in, my um, I'm interning at KSC this summer, and so my internship is going to focus on the plasma application in space crops. So uh, that uh, be you're working. Are you working with Annie? Um, yes, I. I, I Annie just Meyer. Um, information and so they're assigning mentors um, and who all it's going to be but uh, Christina was on the uh, and Joya were on the interview for it and so um, hopefully the COVID-19 will not cancel my internship um, but hopefully we'll get to, to meet in person then uh, through some of that but uh, looking at, at that microbiome and ways to sanitize uh, not only the crops but sanitize the seeds, uh, seeds. so we need to, to join in you in that. Yep, yep. I, I work with Christina Johnson and Joya sits right behind me. So yeah, excellent. Very good. Well, you just have a big ducky behind you right now, Trent. <laughs> or you did. <laughs> <You're> kinda... <laughs> the benefits of working at home, uh, okay. at least the, scen I mean, the scenery is different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This is absolutely fantastic. Now we went a little off schedule a little bit and Michael, I know you wanted to introduce one of our legumes. Oh, I can, I can wait. We don't have to throw that in there today. It's been a full agenda, but there Trent, you, you got to come back next week when I, when, when I do introduce uh, Trifolium because I think you and I got some good ideas of why that's the key candidate. Oh, you're stacking the deck here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I saw clover and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was like, who thinks a clover? That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, now we have white and red clover. I don't know. Do we have a, a team lead on red clover? No, I'm red clover. Oh, we you're don't red. have white. We don't have white clover. Are you doing anything with white clover down there or just red? Uh, we, uh, so one of our uh, scientists, uh, I think she did her uh, thesis on crimson clover. And she uh, informed me it's basically a weed. You can eat it, and it's an ornamental. And so the crew member that we were talking to wanted an ornamental. And I was like, it's a legume. You can eat it, and it flowers. Let's roll with that. So we're testing it. Cool. There you go. Yeah, I have my, I have my, my little pretends uh, garden here. Oh, my God. <laughs> nice. Hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> it's pretty tasty. That's it. That's it. it is. Got a little bit of add spice to it. <laughs> nice texture. You can add that to Monday happy hours there, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll have to figure out what, what it pairs best with, but. <laughs> I don't oh. know, Michael, it, like, sorry. <laughs> 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 um, I guess still want to put a little quick word in a shout out to Kayla. Kayla, for teachers, <laughs> you, you, are, you are the students, you are the type of children and, and young minds and youth that we teachers get up for in the morning. Um, thank you so much for being there. Lori, the other students were equally great to have on board, but you're questioning, Kayla, you're thinking, you're forward thinking, 
and you're digging already. I can still see your mind is active. Um, I am so, so pleased that you were on this call today along with all the specialists. We can never negate the power of our youth and the incredible future that you're gonna carve out for, for yourselves and perhaps affect the world in a greater manner. So Kayla, keep questioning, keep going. What a great opportunity for us to meet you today. Yeah, you're so right, Diana. I concur. And it is a pleasure to work with her uh, on on all these projects this year. So um, thank you, Kayla, for your commitment to to digging deep in this and and owning this project. So uh, some great things can come from it. So, and Lori, you and I attended Space University together in the first year at Johnson Space Center. I'm curious to know if you brought any of the, what we learned to your classrooms. Uh, oh, yes. Um, so when I taught um, sixth grade last year, um, we brought, brought some things in um, from that. It was an earth and space uh, specific for sixth grade. And uh, so I did a few of the activities um, from Space University uh, for that. Uh, last year, I got certified to borrow the lunar It's interesting. It, we usually use video, not audio. <laughs> Better back here towards this direction. Here, we'll move. Moving. Hold on. We'll go in front of uh, Kayla's uh, um, project. Let's see if you can hear me better now. Is that a stronger signal? Yeah, both video yeah, and okay. audio. You're good to go. Um, so the... Um, uh, when I got certified for the lunar and meteorite disk um, uh, to borrow those from J Johnson Space Center. I went around to the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth classes with the, um, the rocks from the moon. And the kids were fascinated by it. And so through that um, opportunity, I took several of the activities from Space University as well as from SEEK um, that I had been to and uh, did those with a number of different classes. So our uh, school administration has just been so supportive of uh, kids learning about space in different classes. Uh, and so it. I think we've, I think we've lost Lori again. Probably a good time for us to wrap the broadcast to see we're almost well, up. At the I uh, added garden peas and green beans to the top of it. And let me tell you, those those plants, they uh, they love the aquaponics system. So uh, Gary, the fish is doing uh, quite well in the tank. <laughs> I want to add something when uh, I get a chance to share uh, what I have posted in my office at Marshall Space Flight Center. Whenever you get a chance. Absolutely. So what do you got, Bill? And after Bill's share, I think what we'll do is we'll do a wrap here for the day. This has been absolutely fabulous. Wow. I could not ask for a better show. I said that last week too, I think. So <laughs> that's my uh, poster on my wall. That's what you see when you walk into my office. That's a great poster. Oh, I love it. You can actually get this from the NASA Public Affairs uh, Office. Uh, they have various posters and things they give out mm -hmm. and you can request this one yeah it's also um you, there's an online version pdf that yep. you can download and print your uh so like gilly you could get those for your uh, print those up for your classroom without having to worry about shipping mm -hmm. yeah. mike if somebody can put that link up it'd be great yeah we'll get that link out to you or we can make it an art design challenge for our students right. to make their own poster that's true we do need, <laughs> we need, need that artwork yeah. All right. So I'm going to wrap it back up to as we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, everyone. Wow. It's always so amazing. Uh, our teachers, our students, our experts. Uh, we heard from uh, Bill Brown, uh, just like uh, being able to tra these, these transcontinental flights with this amazing hardware. We're going to plan something, it sounds like, for uh, the equinox, whether it's autumn or spring, wherever you were on the world here. 
and do that. That'll be really fun to coordinate it. And of course, our focus is on growing plants beyond earth uh, and really making life on <gasps> earth by understanding how plants behave with a specific focus on the Lakuma Knot Challenge. And hearing from you know Trent jumping in and, and joining us and, uh, um, and Dr. Stefan from, uh, 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 from with her extensive background on uh, exogeology. Uh, it's just, wow, I mean, it's just so fascinating. So uh, again, the, our challenge here for you as an educator, for you as a student, if you're a parent and you're thinking about something fun for your kids, you actually don't need to have internet connectivity for this competition. This really it's not a competition, it's more of a, a collaboration. Uh, uh, you can draw a, a, an image of what you think might happen or what you like. You can produce a recipe and share your recipe of why you think your legume candidate is the best. And of course, if you're engaged in scientific discovery and research, we really encourage you to roll up your sleeves a little bit. If you have some access, maybe to a good textbook or a library at home, or obviously the internet, if you've got that capability, uh, then uh, you're going to want to do some homework and think about what all of the considerations we're taking uh, on this call today and even more, what will be the right plants for, to, for us to go with us off world? And what are the right plants that we're gonna need to sustain a planet of getting close to 8 billion people and growing? Um, you know, We are living here, hopefully in a, a better harmonious state with everything else on this planet. And with your help, uh, our future generations, uh, uh, I think we'll be secure. We're giving you a, a lot of problems to solve uh, for the younger generation. We're going to do the best we can to get out of the, give you the information or help open up that information and then get out of the way because I think uh, sometimes we actually in, in, inhibit uh, your curiosity, uh, especially if we look at some more formal learning uh, systems. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining us this session. We're going to try the best we can to publish a little more routine schedule. We're kind of been working that out through the first part of the week. Usually by Wednesday or Thursday, we figure out what we're doing. But keep in mind, if you if you hear this and you want to join us uh, and, and speak, uh, kind of what I call the backstage pass, if anyone here that was speaking would like to speak again, we between this Friday and all the way through June, we're going to be doing this. So let's find a coordinated way to get you on a calendar, get you involved, share your knowledge. And if you're students, I think what we had with Lori's class is the beginning to show us what's possible. I would love to invite a class in here in which we actually do a little bit of a panel. Students have a little more central role so we can carve that out in some of our scheduling as well. So don't be shy. If you're a student, you wanna get some of your friends together. If you're a teacher and you wanna get your students active, let's find a way to do that. But until then guys, have a wonderful weekend. Stay positive and upbeat. If you need to reach out to anyone here, feel free to send us a note at hello at magnitude.io. Uh, we can talk about space, we can talk about plants, but if you just want to talk about talking, uh, feel free to reach out. We're here for you uh, seven days a week, uh, seven to seven Pacific time. You'll be able to reach somebody. Um, so guys, have a great weekend and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Cheers. Smile. Cheers. Bye, thank you. Thank you so much.